city force conference happening in india and so we do these events uh, aiming that uh, we'll unite all the community in silos in all these cities uh, for example goa itself will be working with a lot of small groups uh, building software free software the and, and this event aim to bring all these under one umbrella and uh, which and, and aiming you know this will uh, help all of us uh, for example i'm using uh, one open source software and some other person might be using proprietary alternative to the same uh, so the other person might start uh, find out more about it and uh, may you know kick up their proprietary software with this open source uh, so uh, so once again uh, thank you all of you we have seven speakers today seven talks today and one panel discussion uh, the panel discussion is going to be more more like open discussion uh, where all of you can ask questions or share your thoughts on how we can create free open source software community in goa uh, so this is the opening slide i started giving in all the events that we do uh, so i am vishal and i work for fast united fast united start started with the aim of again uh, bringing all the fast communities together so india uses free and open source software heavily i mean we have 100 plus billion dollar value startups all built on top of mostly free and open source software but we produce very little uh, the proportion is quite low in terms of uh, in in when we see the consumption versus creation of quality free software uh so we started with the aim to see projects like wikipedia linux coming out of india and we have a lot of talent and i believe we'll do it in coming years and we all started seeing already a lot of projects so i'm going to talk about how we uh, what activities and how we have been doing it and our plans and uh, other uh, the way we do it so i am vishal arya you can find me on uh, internet with vish arya with w uh, i s h a r i a r y a so uh, so we started in january 2020 uh, with a conference india voice now it is called india foss uh, we are doing the third edition of this uh, india foss conference in october in bengaluru so we have uh, so in the last uh, three and a half years we have uh, done events in 13 cities uh, and six of them have regular monthly meetups like this where we invite people to speak about their projects it would be two hour three hour events uh, and the long day has uh, i mean long day event like goa for we have done in 13 it's it's more like yearly event than regular so we have 7500 plus members who have participated in all these events uh, and we have done 55 plus events you see in the first column uh, the last row uh, with the help of 100 plus volunteers we have been able to uh, deliver 350 talks which uh, acknowledge or uh, showcase fast projects we also help uh, we also believe that the social organization should use fos leverage fos to uh, run their system and make sure it uh, the fruit money doesn't go into the highly uh, subscribed highly uh, charged proprietary tools so we have been working with a lot of ngos social organizations who use or promote fos uh, to run their organization to run their day to day uh, have their day to day jobs somebody 
So we also uh, have a platform where we teach programming and uh, things related to programming, not just limited to, but uh, it could be, uh, we, start, we, we were open with just programming language earlier, but we decided, recently switched to uh, the idea where we ask people to teach whatever they like, uh, which again should be uh, aligned with the FOSS philosophy, which means sharing uh, the code, the source, and how to do it. So we have, we have a platform where we have live courses. I think this is uh, not the latest number. We have six live courses and five is upcoming. Uh, I'll talk more about in later slides. So we conduct monthly meetups uh, in different cities. So far it's in uh, six cities, Mumbai, Bengaluru, Cochin, Delhi, Chennai, Pune. And we aim to have regular meetups in Goa as well. I hope a uh, lot of people might like that uh, we have this free and open source software co conference happening in Goa, and it should keep continue. Uh, any any response that should we have this regularly? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. And are you volunteering if you are based out of Goa? Yes. There are already two years, and there are many more. <laughs> Is it? I'm just listening from you. I want to hear more. Uh, should we have this more regularly? Yes, yes. 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 Thank you. So, the goal of this event is to have more regular meetups like this. Uh, so, we conduct monthly meetups again to engage the developer community and, and discuss how we can. Uh, so, it could be that the monthly meetups is mostly about uh, me, uh, like like the conference itself, but a shorter uh, duration, two three hours. We do uh, India FOSS, which is the EAD flagship event of FOSS United. Uh, we have, this is the third edition we'll be doing this year in October. You can check out uh, this link, fossunited.org slash events. I mean, you can see a slide uh, link at the end of this in case you are interested to find more about each slide. So yeah, like I mentioned, we have six city chapters. We do monthly meetups over there. I'm hoping Goa will be the seventh slide, uh, seventh num in the number. Uh, yeah, so we give grants to the uh, developers who are building open source, free and open source software, uh, valid free and open source software. So we have been uh, given 13 grants so far. So we used to give big grants like 30 lakh and it's all equity free. Uh, we give it to support to them so that they can continue working on it without the uh, need of or the, you know, uh, spending their time on how to get funds. Uh, without the uh, you know the time spending on other things like funding, and we apart from the grant we have a, a Telegram community of 4,000 plus people, and a lot of uh, people are there uh, to interact to help get help from others. So uh, currently we give grant up to six lakh per year, which is 50,000 per month. So if you are working on any project, do check out uh, slash grant on our website, postunited.org. Um, so like I said, we built a platform to, uh, so that people can learn uh, more about it or you can also create courses if you are passionate about training, teaching. We have a grant of one lakh for the creators. Uh, so do check it out, mon.school. By the way, mon is French word for my. So my school. Uh, so we have a job portal where people can post jobs if they're looking for, if I think somebody was uh, telling me they're looking for some job, uh, some hiring some people, so they can check out job board, they can post free po uh, post the job openings, and the people who are looking for can also find out. So we, like I mentioned, we have been uh, working with social organization, and uh, like I said, we believe in uh, the uh, fact that free software has been created with aiming you know that it will help more people in the society uh, and the NGO have the similar agenda they want to have help uh, people who has uh, who, who are who are not fortunate enough to get the uh, whatever we a lot of people who get who are getting into good colleges so all the social organizations uh, uh, we promote that uh, we will promote and we work on the fact that uh, all the NGOs slash social organizations should get this free software. 
uh, into uh, as their day-to-day -day service, so uh, as their day-to-day -day system. So we formed this uh, alliance called OSS. Uh, this is still uh, WIP work in progress. We have we have been partnering with a lot of uh, people in the ecosystem, starting from the vendor who give who provide service to NGOs, uh, to the to the to the companies who can mentor them. Uh, while they are building the system. Uh, so, you can check out oasishq.org. Uh, so, we also uh, work with, try to, you know, with, so our aim is to, uh, you know, have FOSS should be used by government as well. The public money should not go into proprietary software. It should go to the, uh, the, the place where it has uh, the best impact. So we promote the fact that the government should have a law or public policy where the government funded body should use, must use uh, free and open source software. And uh, we have been uh, working with Taksushila at Think Tank uh, and trying to draft a public policy where uh, we, we uh, point out a few things that they can start uh, and how they can uh, go about it having a FOSS policy. It's, it's, it's a tough thing to do. I mean, I'm, I think this is not going to be uh, immediate, but I'm hoping a few people may understand in the government and slowly adopt it over time. So yeah, do subscribe to our newsletter if you want to get updated what is happening at FOSS United. It's fossunited.org slash newsletter. We recently launched a FOSS club for all the college students, uh, if you are interested in uh, having the similar culture uh, where you uh, want to see more people people building softwares, open source softwares, uh, do check it out, uh, FOSS, United or East Last Clubs. You can apply for leave to the club of your college. And all of this is possible with a lot of companies who are backing us, who support in the idea of creating a community of free and open source software who supporting the idea of giving grants to the people, individual who are building free software for the livelihood for some uh, run over, uh, take over time until they got some way to find out. So we have uh, 11 partners. So you can check out if you want to be a partner. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, you can see the more details on uh, the link slash partners. Yes, that's it. Uh, uh, do follow us on. Uh, we have a Mastodon too. Sorry, I couldn't uh, bring here. We have a Twitter community of 4,000 people. We have we do updates. We share updates on Foss United on our Twitter. Yeah, thank you so much, all of you, once again for joining us here. I'm hoping all of you are gonna enjoy a lot. Uh, there are a lot of the list of a uh, lot of uh, every uh, speaker are gonna share some information which will help us in one way or other tomorrow, uh, today or tomorrow. So yeah, thank you once again. Thank you, thank you, Vishal, for your inspiring vision. We are truly fortunate to have you lead this enlightening event. Now our first talk, talk of the day. Allow me to introduce to you Mr. Frederick Norana, our distinguished journalist and media professional whose passion for storytelling and dedication to his craft have left an indelible mark on the world of journalism. So let us extend a warm welcome to Mr. Frederick Norana, who is going to share first Goa story in pictures. into the past and I feel like a refined wrinkle because it's almost 20 years back. So this uh, presentation is a bit uh, long but we'll finish fast, we'll finish on time. You can start it. Probably you think that we've entered the wrong place because it has a very touristy picture to start with. But uh, this is Goa and everyone expects that even on a rainy day like this 
when uh, when actually we don't want so much uh, the water and the sea. So uh, I think if you if you play the video, it will it will auto play. Okay, it is playing. So this is about the group we started, and uh, I don't want to bore you all with just a series of meaningless snapshots. But I'll try to distill some of the experiences we picked up when the group was going strong. So uh, in the past picture, can you just yeah? In that picture, we have some of our youngsters. They they get back with me for college. Right? Youngsters enjoying some computer games which they just discovered at the at the ECAP exhibition of computers and allied products there. And yeah, you can move on. This is how we used to meet at the Kala Academy. I think Professor Jana is in some of the other photos. So our people have reached all kinds of places. Professor Jana used to be head of botany department of Goa University. Today, he's a big shot. He's the head of the uh, Goa State Research Foundation. That's a newly government of Goa set up body in the last year. So we've met in all kinds of small places. And uh, I made a joke about this. I said the famous cafe Prakash. It's a hole in the wall, actually. If you know it, it's in Panjim. But uh, we used to take over this place once in a way and we used to sit and meet there. And uh, because we had this high profile, all kinds of people would come for our group. If they search for FOSS and for Goa or Linux and Goa, TNU Linux and Goa, they would just come out of the woodwork as it was. And the moral of the story is that there are a lot of people who are interested in this approach towards creating software. But uh, the left hand, if you can just stop, yeah, if you could just stop, uh, stop, stop, stop. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And unless we help to discover these people and find out who they are, we cannot build a community. And the point I was making when I was talking over tea is that the beauty of the communities that were set up in the past was simply this. They had no bureaucracy, they had no hierarchy. Anyone could set up a Linux user group. They used to call it Linux in those days. If you were four or five people in a college, you could sit down and set up one. You didn't have to take permission from anyone. They had made one request to us. They said, when you're setting up a group, please give it a name called India Linux User Group Dash, where Dash is the city name or the state name. So we were India Linux User Group Goa. So that helped to build up a movement connecting all people and giving them a certain commonality. And of course, everyone set up their own Yahoo groups in those days. And the Yahoo groups had to bring people together and connect and share information. And then they started sharing between the groups, so everyone got a sense of what was happening in other parts of the country. And we kept going to Bangalore, Bangalore in those days, and attending their meetings. Of course, there were other factors also. Atul Chitnis, who was one of the great guys, passed away early. So that was a big setback in 2007 or 9 or 11 or something like he died of cancer, unfortunately, very sad. So that kind of collapsed. In those days, he used to, he single-handedly, he and people like uh, the other techies from Delhi, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting their names, were, would write in articles, magazine articles, they would create CDs and share the CDs, because downloading was not an option in those days. We couldn't download a CD worth of data, the lines were so slow. So when they when they created it and put it out in PC Quest, there were lines on the road, like uh, people would wait to buy PC Quest, in three hours it would get sold out, those kind of things. So, so, you know, in that sense, uh, we have lessons to learn from this place. Some, one of our, some of our friends have passed on. So, so, there's some very sad music, but the story is not sad. Huh? It's, just, it's just a rendering of a Goan theme on the guitar by my friend Rocky Tamaris. A group from the NGCO, sorry, just yeah, from, from the engineering college where uh, Professor Aidu and Professor George so and all got these boys together and set up a group there. So it was that simple to set up groups and we can do it again. Of course, we used to meet a lot at the science center of uh, Sox. At the uh, Goa Science Center, which was uh, which which is there. And in particular, Mr. Joshi used to be very supportive in giving us a chance. We used to meet at cafes, we used to meet at all kinds of places. And uh, Along the way, the, the Computer Society of India gave us a stall at the exhibition of computers and allied products, ECAP. So I was just trying to capture all these photos which may not mean much to anyone who was not there, but it is my dream to write about the history of this period so that we don't lose the, the, you know, the story 
which is so important and which is part of what what was achieved and of course there was a lot of uh, outreach like how you are trying to reach out to ngos we would reach out to students and pass the word around this is a meeting at the science center so everyone is having a good time this is all about fun the knowledge is only incidental but it happens it happens yeah and uh, yeah we can move on we can move on just to So again, meeting at cafes and all these kind of things. Sometimes our meetings were a little bit more formal than other times. Yeah. So yeah, we just stop here a minute. Recently, an 80-year-old guy from Hyderabad asked me. He said, "You know what happened to Sudhakar Chandra Shekhar? Sudhakar Chandra Shekhar was called Thats." and he was one of the first guys who actually was in silicon valley and had sent a book to doc patta from hyderabad doc patta sarthi who was a scientist trained in france and all that and that convinced doc patta to go into free and open source and he learned from there and he became quite a guru in his own in his own right he's now 80 and he was searching to for thanks to thank him for that book which he had sent 25 years back So you know, just building the links can make a huge difference. It's all a one-to-one -one growth that happens. But at some level, if the chemistry is right, it can also you can have exponential growth. Yeah. So he came for one of our meetings and he was he was speaking in Panjim. So like you know, this is Dr. Shama Fernandez from the Goa Institute of Management. Jim, she was a professor there. All these kind of unknown persons who we don't know are existing, but they are there. Supporting, providing support and services for Linux, and I think that is so important if we want to build the ecosystem, because people have this difficulty of how to get started onto this new OS, and the learning curve is steep. So once we installed it for a friend, and he said, we asked him, did you use it? He said, yeah, I used it, but he didn't tell me one thing. How do I shut it down? He said. <laughs> This is Dr. Anil Seth, who was with uh, TCS in Mapsa, and then he went into uh, the. Paul Agnel Agnel Engineering College Father Agnel and uh, PCC PCC and he was one of our very strong <coughs> supporters uh, for a long time educated in the US and things like it's amazing how people who are like minded will actually come together uh, yeah then i was telling all about the exhibition of computers and allied products we can just jump through this where they gave us a stall and they gave us this in mandovis unfortunately mandovis is in a sad state now because of some Family dispute, so the hotel is closed. But it was a big place then, and they actually gave us a hall uh, free of cost, where we would hold a series of seminars. Uh, you know, maybe 15, 20, 23 seminars in the space of two days. Yeah. So it had very high visibility. That's Arvind Clement, if you remember, who who is in the Gulf at the moment. All people have reached all kinds of places. Of course, our, our hero friend and hero G Karuna. This is not my photo, and this is not in Goa. But this man sitting here is a man of few words, and I must say something. He is one person who has done most for Indian computing in the Linux, Indian language computing in the Linux uh, environment. And uh, he has come to Goa many times. We have interacted with him many times. His brother is working at NIC, National Informatics. So Karuna is our friend. And Yunus Sheikh, of course, uh, he is based in the Gulf. He is uh, one of the engineers for uh, one of the telecom companies there. So, so because of the high profile, my point is that even a tiny, tiny uh, space can punch beyond its weight. So, because of the high profile, and we kept spamming the net and writing about what we were doing, people would naturally get attracted to us. So, this uh, this person, the guy sitting on the computer, you saw him in the earlier photo. He's from Singapore. He's an Indian, Indian. Indian origin person based in Singapore, and he actually visited PCC, you know, to see how they could link up and tie up. See, many things didn't work out, so I'm not saying that everything was hunky dory, but the potential was there. The potential is still there. Yeah. And then, uh, whenever anyone was passing through, we would catch him and organize a meeting. So, so Krishna Kant Ma uh, Mane, who is visually challenged, 100% lack of vision. 
he has created GNU Khata, which is a software for accounting, Indian accounting, uh, with a very desi kind of touch. Uh, other some other young techies and things like that. Right? Uh, so so then along the way we would also have these mini picnics like overnight picnics and we if anyone would call us we would go in a team. So once we went to Belgaum, these are some of the students at KLES I think and they are influenced by Stallman and they are having some play or something there with guitar and all that. So so this is uh, this is Bangalore where we would also go to Bangalore to, to take part in the events there. Of course again Bangalore. And uh, this major event that was held once a year would kind of keep us all together. And now we are reaching the end of the presentation. So I'm saying my point is that while we give and while we create and while we build community, we are also gaining back in a huge way. So I've just photographed some of the places I reached because of free and open source. The intention was not to write piggyback on it. And that was never our intention when we started it out, but that's the way it worked. So we reached all these kind of fancy places like you know uh, Singapore and uh, Uganda and, and uh, other places where there was even a you know there was even a group promoting women in, in, in free and open source because it was always felt that ours was a community which was very male dominated and that's a fact. So there was a group called Linux Chicks. I don't know whether it's still active or not. It has its odd name. So Sulamita is from Brazil. She had come down once. And yeah, we can move. So this uh, this is our participation in Bangalore, where we are taking part in. And we would go in a bus, like eight or ten of us, taking you know, taking uh, two or three sleeper compartments on our own and occupying it, and it really worked. And then we were involved with something called the Goa Computers in Schools project. Not very successful, but a lot of idealism went into it. They actually got hardware from uh, some expats who sent it by the container load, but they had difficulty in, in, in uh, getting it cleared from the customs and all. And of course, it was all based on open source and free software. So one of the Goan expats uh, from Netherlands, I think her name is Ruth, R-U-T. And she's brought this one laptop per child. So today, all these things look funny and they look like, you know, why were you all trying all these things uh, in those days? But computing was not a problem, was not a possibility then. So one day, uh, Someone said that RMS is in India. If you all are willing to play his one week playing fair, you can send him to Goa. He'll come to Goa. So then he had a meeting with the chief minister. And uh, these uh, fat cats from industry were a little bit surprised. They said, Are you going to be a hippie? You've not got a hippie from the beach, no brought him here. Because like, you can see, he's not bothered about things with his appearance and all that. And I could have just got anyone and said, He's RMS. So, <laughs> But he was, he was. They, they, had a, they had a dinner for him, the chief minister had a dinner then. And uh, that's at the Marriott. Yeah, we can move. A few pictures of him in Goa. And of course, he, you know, he's got these funny ideas about right and wrong. And he says, I don't believe in any religion. And he says, Are you sure they're putting that tikka on me? It's not religious. No, he said, No, 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 it's not religious. I don't know, whatever the significance is. And then uh, from him we also learned he, he was sitting in the office of the GEC principal and checking his email. And he said that he spends in those days he used to spend eight hours a day just leading this global movement from the top of his computer by by yeah we can go on by by basically yeah that's it. By checking his email and coordinating with everyone at GEC. Yeah, next. He doesn't seem to be bothered that the principal is uh, waiting to talk to him, you know, he's just reading his mail. So, yeah, just a few pictures and yeah. Uh, so, you know, while we were building a community, we got back hugely. I would request all of you all not to do because you're expecting something, but you know very well that the benefit will come to everyone and will definitely uh, reach all over the place. This is a study which was done in Finland on, on free and open source in the developing world. Uh, yeah. Of course, people like Arvind, yeah, just one back. Arvind Yadav. It's okay, it's okay. Arvind Yadav, who uh, played a big role in uh, taking uh, free and open source ahead in Goa from the tech side of it. I did nothing. I'm just, uh, you know, kind of self appointed secretary of the group. 
because everyone was not into communicating and I, that was the only thing I could do. Even till today I struggle to install. I cannot install Linux straight, I can tell you that. And I still struggle with my technology, but these guys actually help to, to keep the technology side going. While we focused on the communication building community, which is also needed. It's also needed in a certain way and FOSS, the FOSS network that has come up is doing amazing work. If you see how much they are focused on uh, community building, it's, it's quite a lot, very much. The only one thing I always say, we Indians are great at mastering the technology, but we are not so good at understanding either the politics of the technology or building the commun communication that the technology needs to survive. So last one or two points I want to make. People keep saying that Indians don't contribute to, to Linux, but when you look deeply, you understand that they are contributing, but their contribution is not very visible. So for instance, I remember once I wrote an article which said, that uh, Linux has found its poster boy in the country, and the poster boy is not even a boy, it's a girl. So there was this young engineering student who was a kernel hacker, and she was a prominent speaker at one of the first audit meetings in Bangalore. And no one even knew that she was doing this work. So if you are doing the work but you are not visible, then you start believing after some time that we are not contributing. Now like Calibre, Calibre is there, the software which is which is fantastic for creating ebooks, which is so important. It's the best in the world. No one even knows that COVID Goyal. Most people won't know that COVID Goyal is sitting in Mumbai. And of course, he was in the US, he was a student there and all, but he wrote it. You know, he's an Indian origin guy. He's, he's, he, he has done the work out of So we are not celebrating our own people, and uh, there is an information problem as far as understanding it. But I'm sure that the FOSS network is going to cure that and help to understand it. I'm so grateful for the time you've given me for listening to me. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them on. Yeah, because time is getting out. I don't want to overstep it. But we have learned a lot. We have not been able to sustain it as much as we should have and could have. That's another question, why? Okay, I think burnout is there and there are other factors. But the next generation can do and will do, I'm sure. Thank you. Entire school curriculum 
of Goa from computer, uh, like in a computer school curriculum, can be executed on Linux on the Raspberry Pi. So that was not something many people were ready to believe. They were like, no, we have to use Windows. The entire curriculum was explicitly designed saying Windows, Microsoft Office, explicitly written over there. And that was being a challenge to introduce open source. And that was causing a problem uh, because yeah, you have to pay Microsoft right, a huge amount of licensing fees. Uh, it was actually kind of illegal, you can say, because a government literally is saying you have to use a private company's uh, thing into it. Uh, use of Raspberry Pi is a very, very low cost hardware, and I'm talking about Raspberry Pi 2, not even the Raspberry Pi 1, Raspberry Pi 2. And it was able to run all of that thing, including internet, word, word processing, spreadsheets, paint, everything which was there. Uh, we proved it by traveling across Goa, and that led to change of syllabus for 9th and 10th back in 2014, if I remember correctly. And uh, that introduced Linux and uh, Scratch for the first time in Goa's computer curriculum. So let's, this talk is not about me. Uh, this talk is about this particular tool called Gojo. But why teach programming, right? Uh, I want to start by addressing that. Why Why should we even teach programming to kids? And I sometimes take a, a position that we shouldn't teach programming. It, uh, it's like kind of an irony because I'm talking about a tool that does that. Uh, but hear me out here, right? Uh, programming on its own is nothing big. If you just teach somebody programming, right? Yeah, ChatGPT is going to take over. Uh, but there is something that is very, very critical about programming. We cannot deny the fact that it is important to learn logical thinking. And don't, like, you know, logic appears to be something very easy. It is not. If you really try to, uh, if you just need to do something, right, explain somebody how to make a pulao over the phone. And if the other person gets it right when he has not done it before, very good. You are a programmer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's it. So let us see how we can make our logic strong by actually learning programming. And, and while talking about one tool, which is fully open source, let me also acknowledge other tools. There is uh, uh, Scratch, an excellent tool, uh, which introduces kids by, uh, you know, to all these concepts by letting them explore themselves. Uh, there are other languages, like Python as well, uh, which is being used worldwide. and. Uh, it's good, I'm not going to say it's not. Uh, professionally, we use it as well. Uh, then there are other tools like Sonic Pi and other things which is based on the Ruby programming language, right? So, then why Gojo? So let's talk about that, right? Uh, and again, this is not going to be Scratch versus Gojo or anything like that, but just purely about Gojo, what it can do. And let us see whether we see value in that, okay? Uh, the first thing, is it okay if I sit? So the first thing we, we need to do, right, is, and that is what we do while we learn programming in even with the current computer science courses. The way we are taught is something called as an imperative method, which is you are sort of giving an instruction to the computer to do something line by line. So Scratch, if you see, is a purely interpretive, uh, uh, interpreted thing. It is command based. Uh, you have, the, basically every line over there does not give any output. So let me give you an example. We can do something very similar around here. So uh, am I audible? Yes. OK. So let me just start by saying, oops. OK. Uh, let me know if the uh, size is visible. Let me zoom it a bit. So what I'm going to do now is, what I'm going to do here is do something very, very scratch type. And you might see the commands familiar if you have seen Scratch. Okay, so I'm going to move something forward and say 100 steps, right? So there you go, and it draws a line for me. Okay, next I can do something uh, interesting, like turn right, and it will go up and turn right. That's total. Okay, I can actually repeat this four times, but there is better way. Uh, I can just do this, say repeat it four times. And uh, yeah, auto format. So this tool 
will actually support sort of formatting. And if I run this, it will draw me a square. All right. Now here is something that is very very tricky to do in Scratch. I'm not saying it is entirely possible, but uh, the main thing it could do is just with a single line, right? I can say set speed and say super fast because you saw, right? It takes time to go around. So I can say super fast and yeah, it's directly there. Now, you know. Sometimes just by combining all these things together, you can build various set of patterns. Like for example, yeah, so this is repeat, right? So I can just keep on going something, uh, uh, repeating something, and then you get an entirely different set of pictures. So I have a repeat four here. So I can sort of just say, you know, uh, repeat it something like uh, uh, 360 by 10 times. Uh, and towards the end here, I can just say uh, turn right by 10. So again, reformat, and there you go. So just a small change does, does something entirely different, right, for you. So this is how things can get very, very uh, interesting quickly enough. But yeah, let's go back to the first, uh, first thing that we did. So repeat. Go times move sorry, forward 100 and then turn right and it draws me a square. I have not kept a uh, set speed for a time being. This is possible in Scratch. Now something that is not possible in Scratch is that you can fill the color. right? So you can set the fill color and say red. And as it keeps going, it will start filling in the color. So you can actually start filling in the color in, in the objects that you are designing. That is something which is not possible in most of the tools which are there. Uh, but uh, from whatever I have seen with kids, no matter what tool you give them, right, they always find a way to make it possible because they don't know these things are impossible, right? So they'll always find a way. It is us who say it is impossible, but kids will always end up finding some ways. But beyond this, right? Uh, what also makes it even more interesting is defining what is called as a gradient, right? So, so gradient, uh, sorry, I haven't yet defined it. So, let me say linear. Uh, yeah, uh, linear gradient, and that's what you can see here, right? find those two colors. Uh, yeah, actually, might be a little time gap, but I still want to show this. So x1, y1 is the starting position where I want to go. So I'll let her go 0, 0. The initial color I want to start is uh, red. Uh, x2, y2 is, this is 100, right? So second position is 100 by 100. Uh, the next color I want to have is yellow and cyclic I'll say is false and you can see what it does. Right? I haven't yet filled it with this color, so yeah, I mentioned it to fill it with this color. And it should fill it with that gradient. Right? So now you can actually create something very, very wonderful with just some few commands and I won't take much time going through all the examples because I already have something with me uh, created by people. So if you see, most of this stuff is actually created uh, those means. But why should it just be us, right? Let us see what kids have done. This is a, a student from Goa <coughs> called Amol, Amol Nine, And take some time to see what he has done, right? This is all total graphics, by the way. Did you like that? Some more. Uh, just to get some idea.
अच्युतम केशव कृष्णदा doing that on a code uh and he doesn't stop his creativity just there right like he goes almost on every occasion he tries to express his creativity just by doing this right and it is not like using some separate image created in some another tool it's by using what exists here as well fully to the graphics right um and this was something he did for the sir so the reason i showed this right videos is this video has the what this kid did give us an idea um so if you see what he does is he first create this uh, videos then he actually has to find a music for it and he has to go in another tool and do it and right? that's a problem when it comes to giving a uh system to kids to express their creativity that's not so right right but we'll see what we did there uh but before that right there is a problem in this approach and the problem with this approach is uh there are multiple fronts so let me show you something right so there is this set of pros that is being generated using turtle graphics and how it works is you are basically uh let me actually just do one so in order to do that you would see how much effort it is there just to draw one crow okay uh for that i'll need to comment this line also and that is where turtle graphics is a problem because you have to get the turtle back sometimes where it started and how do you do that so crow let us say 100 i'll give you 100 because it will make it much more visible take a look at what it does it first tries to draw arc to the left then it needs to come back then it has to again make sure that it is facing up and then draw it at the right angle right that's a lot of thinking and then if you need to do something like you know uh doing it across uh you know those multiple crows like a scenery where they are you see four or five crows flying across that becomes a problem right so that ends up becoming a problem so because you know it is possible i'm not saying it is not entirely not possible but take a look at what all it needs to do right you have to say okay start with the crow then you know change your heading in this direction move up move right set your size to something else and it keeps becoming a problem right so how can we solve this what if i can just take one crow make an object out of it and then start placing it elsewhere and that is where the entire concept of object oriented starts right and what do we learn in uh while we are learning object oriented languages yeah object is something that starts with class and then we don't see why so let us take an example purely an uh, you know imperative code out here what i would now do is i'll convert this imperative object a command into an expression right so the way i would do that is i will say well we have one crow or i'll let us say define a uh, single crow and this single crow is a picture of my crow of size what size did i start first 50 right and it doesn't draw so the reason it doesn't draw is because uh yeah as you can see here right the reason the reason it doesn't draw is because i have to explicitly now say draw this what i could now do is i can combine the same image multiple times so i can say def two crows and i can combine them into a stack right we all learn stack right so here i will say there is this single crow and then there is this single crow that's translated uh sorry that scale uh by a factor of 0.75 and that's translated they translated as in mood uh 110 comma uh 50 and i think uh, 
if I try to draw this two pros, it will draw that for me. And I can keep on going, you know, I can keep on building the same kind of a structure further. So I can now say three crows and use two crows as, as the background for me. Uh, sorry, I'll have to start one being a single crow followed by two crows. So one crow and two crows is three crows, right? And if I try to draw this, becomes three crows. I can keep on going like this. So it simplifies an idea a lot. I can use a composition pattern to do this. And there are multiple examples in which uh, uh, kids have done this. Uh, but a major thing that you can do with uh, 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 pictures, right, is the artwork that you can make along with this, right? Uh, and I'm not trying to say you can't do good artwork using total graphics, but let me just show you an example of what picture graphics can do. Just watch. <coughs> Again, now this time there is no separate, uh, uh, the audio is not created somewhere out. Audio is created right within this. And that was uh, the new feature which we introduced uh, in Gojo just a few months back. Uh, and we started to work over it almost a year back. But let me show you how deep we can go with it. And let me know if you can recognize the music. guess the music? That's Gulgulaya, <laughs> right? So that is musical part which got introduced around here. Now you can do all those things. You saw the previous one, right? Where there was an animation and music made in a single video. So yeah, uh, that option exists. And combined with that, you can do far better things. So let me just play this. because it is built over a language called Scala which runs over an entire JVM ecosystem. So all the tools that are available to us just become available straight away. Right? Uh, and the final thing which we sort of wanted to talk about was uh, we talked about music. Yeah. The recent thing that we are doing, right? Kids are very much interested in gaming and not a kind of a low level gaming. They want to do something high level. So it's like, why not? You know, we have recently launched Moonlander, right? So why not try something landing on the moon? 
take a look at the frame rate above. So hopefully ISRO also wins this time. Uh, that would be good for us, right? Uh, now this was about the low level part. Uh, any open source tools requires contribution. Right? Uh, this is the source code for it. Source code is completely available. And I would use this last few minutes to request contribution from everyone. And the contribution can come in the form of testing out these features, documenting it yourself. Right? Documentation is the most important thing we need help with. Please, whoever can, try out these features, document it for us. That would be really, really good contributions. Second thing would be uh, taking this code, uh, taking its features, taking the tool, testing out with students. You might have kids at home. Test it out with them. See how they use it. Do they find it easy? What do they find easy? What do they find difficult? Come back to us with it. That would be a very, very good help for us. There are issues listed. If you are, if you like to learn coding or if you are a coder, do take those things up, fix it, raise your PR, that helps as well. And finally, right, uh, we are, no single person can be expert and the collective expertise of the whole uh, open source community. So please help us to tell us how we can organize ourselves better to, uh, you know, make the open source development of this tool better. Thank you very much. Yeah, any questions? Yeah. No, it is already there. Uh, so there is there is a tool called iPojo, which is a web version of this. iPojo, it's iPojo.in. So that's a web version available. Uh, that is also going uh, simultaneously being developed because Pojo platform is developed over JVM, but iPojo runs on JavaScript. So we have to find some compatibility things between these two. But it is available. Most of the total graphics that we have seen, except the gradient part, works over it. Yeah. Uh, which uh, standard uh, do they Seventh is a any more questions? So this is part of the coding show. What is the scheme that was going to do this coaching thing or something separate? Well, I'm not the spokesperson of the scheme. Uh, I was part of it when this uh, syllabus was getting designed. So standard 6th is on scratch. Uh, standard 7th is on coding. It's mentioned as uh, uh, just like you know we don't we didn't want to well designing the syllabus we didn't want to say kojo because then it doesn't make us different from anything else right so it is kojo with like the kojo is one of the options there but uh, you can there are many, multiple other options there is code dot world for example which you can use uh, which sort of gives you the similar benefits of what is there but it is using Haskell uh, and uh, I'm not sure like how many people can comfortably teach it. Uh, I'm not worried about students. We have tried with students. Students have done great. I'm rather worried about how many people can teach it. Uh, so, uh, so that's why this seems to be the current best. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, same uh, topic, basically. Uh, how have you found uh, it? Like, is it really that challenging to build curriculums on particular uh, <coughs> programming languages, or is it? Uh, better, easier to do it with a uh, like because then it gives you narrow focus rate. Does it help? Uh, no, as in uh, why should we build it on a single programming language is, is a, even a bigger question, right? Uh, probably I'll teach you some Scala now and you may grow up and wanting to do something else and then the Scala is not useful to you. 
they shouldn't literally be teaching programming languages. They should be looking at concepts. But that is where the challenge comes, right? Right. Most of the programming tools are imperative. Uh, for example, we have uh, uh, like Python. We are talking about right. Most of the examples in Python are imperative. Uh, the Scala was chosen as one of the good option because it does imperative op option equally good. It does object oriented equally good. It does functional programming equally good. So, I as a learner, because what does NEP talk about? Learning how to learn. So I should have freedom in learning everything. So yeah, I want to start with maybe imperative. Allow me to start with imperative. I want to now learn some you know, more functional things because it solves my problems better. Allow me to use that also, right? Don't come and say, you know what? I am going to give you an error if you try to return a value from here. So that should not be the case. Um, if you want to start, get started with contributing to iCojo or Kojo, where would you recommend you get started? Um, anywhere, like, you know, these are four areas. iCojo, you mean? No, like, uh, is there a GitHub where you go? Yeah, there, there is a GitHub, like obviously. Every, uh, every, uh, every tool in general, you should have some repository, right? Open source. So, so, yeah. Is this where the discussions also happen? Like, if I want to maybe pick up a feature? There are, there are user start. groups. Yeah, there are user groups around it, yeah. And how would you find those? So uh, it is mentioned on the website also. Oh, it's mentioned on the website. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But you can participate in it through this also. People generally come in and would rather raise issues if you need to do something. Uh, apart from that, the source code also has good amount of tests. Uh, which we opened, I opened up here, right? So it also has good amount of tests back here. Right? So that is there. And the tool itself is also built on introducing those kind of concepts to people. So uh, if I sort of go there and probably try and do something, right, which most of the tools, right, don't have this inbuilt. So if I sort of, uh, uh, Titan, yeah. So let me go here, right. So do you see here an example? This would be more at a code level. This code starts with tests. This code was actually designed using test-driven development. Right. Uh, you can see that it is, and it is telling you the test results here. There are three test results. So you have a uh, teaching tool for students that actually introduces them how to write their tests. There are very few tools which do this. There is this one. Then there is Racket. For example, the Racket is based on Lisp. Um, so, so yeah, that's an option. Here you are testing based on the starting and the ending phase. So there is a given part. There is a given part, and then I'm saying if I call my function, what should what should it result into? Result. Yeah. What should it? Yeah. Any questions? Cool. I'll I'll be here for the day. So feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kamat, for this thought-provoking talk. Your dedication to Kojo is truly inspiring. Next up, we have Mr. Bhavesh Bhatt. He is passionate about open source contributions and has made significant contribution to various open source projects related to machine learning. He is a core contributor to TensorFlow, TensorFlow Hub, a library and open repository for the reusable machine learning. In his talk, Bhavesh will share his experience with open source contribution and how it helped him to grow as a data scientist. He will also discuss the benefits of contributing to open source projects and how developers can get started with contributing to TensorFlow Hub and other projects. Please give a round of applause.
start uh, good afternoon everyone uh, today I'll be talking about how you can create some amazing web applications using tensorflow hub uh, an open source library in Python called as radio which is gaining a lot of popularity and if you have an idea in terms of creating a machine learning model, I'll show you using pre-trained models how you can, uh, from the idea stage, read at the web application stage with very few lines of code. With, say, if there is no pre-trained model that is directly available, how you can use, say, retraining uh, process, which I'll kind of cover in the entire session as well. How you can retrain your model with your data and then come up with a machine learning model that is fine-tuned for your particular data set. And finally, once you have everything in place, how do you deploy the model using a simple web application based library called as Gradio? So without wasting any further time, I'll kickstart the discussion. Uh, so I work as a senior data scientist at Colgate Palmolive. Uh, I'm pretty sure the company is kind of renowned, everyone brushes their teeth, so uh, yeah. So Colgate is uh, the company that makes toothpaste. Uh, I also happen to run a YouTube channel wherein I teach machine learning data science. So if you ever search for my name on YouTube, you should find my channel as well. So. I'll quickly move forward, all of this is not that relevant, but uh, technically uh, the way I would start off this discussion given that I have 20 minutes is for every problem that you face, be it in software engineering or in machine learning, the one ideology that you have to keep in mind is if there is something that is good enough that already exists, don't reinvent the entire wheel, just try to realign it to your problem statement and create a solution around it. Okay. So this is where this particular code comes into picture. Don't reinvent the wheel, just realign it, which is what the crux of the entire talk will be. So machine learning is evolving every day. How many of you heard of Llama 2, the model that was open sourced by Microsoft and Facebook very recently? Uh, Chat GPT is like, a, uh, like an old story now. So Llama 2 has come up recently. So 
there's a lot of advancement that's happening in the ML space, wherein there are new models that are coming up almost every day, uh, which is where it's kind of very relevant to keep an eye on what's happening. So Llama 2, just for context, is an open source model. It was trained on around 3.2 some 3 .2 billion uh, trillion uh, records, and then the entire uh, model was fine-tuned. So all of this is open source, right? But when you have to go ahead and use an open source model or a solution you have to build uh, using open source, there are some challenges that everyone faces, right? So how do you use it? Not a lot of repositories will have good readme structures in them, which is where it becomes really difficult to use that particular repository. Uh, is it safe? Now one piece that's kind of gaining popularity in the ML ecosystem is how is the model trained? Right? So training of the data uh, while creating the ML model, what kind of data was used, was it safe, was it, uh, did it have an inherent bias into that particular data set, all of that was that taken into account while training. All of these factors is something that you'll have to keep in mind. Is it fair? Is it the latest version? Like Llama 1 released in January, if I'm not wrong, this year after ChatGPT came out and we are in which month? July. So in July, we have the second version of Llama as well. So things are moving very rapidly. So you shouldn't be in a stage where you're using a model which was kind of, uh, which looks really latest, but there are multiple versions that have come out beyond that as well, which is where, what do you do? How do you create an ML solution from your idea to the end solution stage is where TensorFlow Hub comes in. Uh, before going into TensorFlow, TensorFlow is a library that was introduced by Google. It's an open source library. Uh, it has multiple facets to it. You can use, for, so whatever data you kind of feed into the model, all the data preparation can be abstracted out using TensorFlow. Then you can build machine learning models. There are various categories of models wherein you will find pre-trained models as well. But you can build machine learning models using TensorFlow. Then you can deploy models. So. Ideally, there's no point having your uh, machine learning model in your system that's running fine, right? You'll have to create and you'll have to deploy the model so that you can use it later on as well, which is where you can deploy models. And then once you have a model deployed, chances are with every four or five months, you will have some amount of drift in your output as well. Uh, given that the data keeps changing, your training data was something that was say historically used. So your model predictions would go off after a certain interval of time, which is where you'll have to monitor the output. If the output is changing significantly as compared to what your actual expected output should be, then you will have to retrain the entire model based on new data and this entire loop of preparing data, uh, manipulating data, then building the new model. All of this has to be automated, right? You cannot keep doing it in a manual process, which is where implementing MLOps solutions is also possible in TensorFlow. So which is where now what I will discuss is TensorFlow Hub. So TensorFlow Hub is like GitHub for machine learning models. So GitHub is some is that one repository, is that one place where you find multiple repositories, right? Open source repositories where you can find code, where you can find the inner working of, working of the repository, how you can use that particular tool as well, right? Uh, a similar version for machine learning that has been open sourced by Google is TensorFlow Hub. You have various collection of models here. You have images, you have text, you have video, and you have audio. So in case of images, uh, we saw a demo just before my session, right? Which was image recognition. So you have different classes which have been trained in that model using convolutional neural networks. And then you can detect which objects appear in your live video feed and all as well. Then you have text related uh, new, uh, say models as well. Uh, the chatbots are, so chatbots are really gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, people want to create chatbots for their internal database, which is like the biggest uh, thing that companies and enterprise want today. So there are a lot of text-based models that are available right now. Uh, images and videos go hand in hand. So if you can build a classifier that runs on image, uh, if you have like a high-end system that can process multiple frames of images together, then you would have a video classification model as well. Then you have something related to audio. So if you have multiple people speaking, if you want to segregate which speaker is speaking at what instant, then you have models for that as well in TensorFlow Hub. Uh, this is what I've already mentioned. So these are the different categories of models that you will find. This is not an exclusive list. This is like a small mini list of models that are already present.
uh, again the other advantage is so there is also PyTorch that uh, is very famous in the research community for machine learning but the reason why TensorFlow if you use, if you are looking to deploy it end to end uh, which is where TensorFlow gives you that flexibility so you create a model and if you have to implement an entire pipeline of retraining and the entire MLOps pipeline that can be uh, created using the TensorFlow extended speed uh, then you have TensorFlow JS if you happen to create a simple model that you think should run on the browser itself then TensorFlow JavaScript or Ten TensorFlow JS comes into picture so you can take your actual model uh, pass it through a converter con convert that to TensorFlow JS and then you have TensorFlow JS equivalent model uh, how many of you have heard of Arduino boards, Raspberry Pi boards? Most of you, right? So if you have to create machine learning models that run on edge devices, now one uniqueness about edge devices is they have very little CPU and they have very little memory to store like huge models, which is where you will have to compress the current model so that it fits into the memory of that particular uh, device that you are running on which is where you can use converters from TensorFlow and deploy uh, say machine learning models using TensorFlow Lite. Again Coral is again a type of an edge device wherein you can use, you can deploy it on those edge devices and uh, use the edge device for predictions. Okay. Now how do you use it? Uh, can anyone tell me which dog breed this is? So we have an answer Poodle, it's like a half answer, there is one more word before Poodle. I'll give you a hint that the first letter starts with T. It's a three letter word and it's not Tom. <laughs> toy, toy Poodle, we have the answer right. So, uh, this, entire, so this particular dog breed is Toy Poodle. Now how do you, how do you how do you use a, an existing model? So say for example I have this hypothetical use case wherein a client has come to me, he's told me that I want you to create a solution that is able to detect dog breeds for me, right? So how do you go about creating a web application for such a situation? Will you use, so one way is you can use all the images that are available on Google, uh, scrape through all the images, uh, label them and then create a classifier using say convolutional neural networks. But a smarter way could be try finding a pre-trained model that has most of the classes that you want to predict in that model itself and that is something that you can kind of wrap around in a web application and use it for prediction. So uh, I'll give you some bits and pieces of the code, uh, some will be a pseudo code, some will be the actual code but how do you go about doing or how do you go about building an application like this? You import TensorFlow as TF, uh, can all of you see the screen? So you start off with TensorFlow as TF. TensorFlow hub as hub. Uh, now images in a matrix format are basically three dimensional. So you have three channels for uh, the images. So whatever uh, you capture in an image photograph, the JPG file that you have, it will have three channels RGB and uh, if you have a transparent image you will have four channels uh, which is your PNG images which are without the background. They have four channels. One is so that is for the uh, your uh, alpha value which is uh, how much of transparency do, do you require uh, but in our case we will only stick to JPEG images which is three dimensional but if you pass in for prediction multiple images if you want like a batch wise prediction you will have this particular array as a 4D image so here I have written batch comma 224 comma 224 comma 3 so 224 comma 224 is the input image size that this particular model expects and 3 is the amount of channels that are there when you pass in that particular image. Uh, I am using this particular model which is the MobileNet V2 model. It has multiple categories of dog breeds already part of the inference or the prediction of this particular model. So what happens in this case is I don't require say feeding in a new set of data to this particular model. I can directly use it as it is and make the predictions from this. Okay. Once I have this what I do is I have the set of images, I have downloaded the model which is uh, located in this particular location on, on TensorFlow Hub. Uh, I pass it through a function called as classify, uh, not a function but basically a placeholder that I have kept that keeps the model in hand. Uh, then what I do is this particular output of this particular model would give me list of probabilities. 
this current model has been trained on 1000 classes so there are 1000 unique classes of images that this particular model can predict out of those 1000 classes the probability scores for every classes have been listed out based on the image you pass in the class that has the maximum probability is the class that the model is predicting in our case okay so for example toy poodle will lie in a particular value say randomly i'll pick 345 right so 345th class is what the model says is the actual class of this particular image that it sees right currently what i've done is i'm passing in only one image so when i pass in the image the output that i get is class 266 and corresponding to class 266 there will be a mapping file like a dictionary of sorts which will have id to class mapping okay so once the output of this particular say probability score is say 266 which is in our case class ids class ids would map, would be mapped to a dictionary the dictionary would give me the actual name of the uh, image that is predicted okay so this current dog breed is toy poodle okay uh, I told you that I the client was very specific that he wanted a machine learning model which could classify dog breeds okay not every client is that kind right he'll have a different expectation in mind companies would have different expectations in mind they'll be like we want something specifically trained on a particular data set how do you now build a model do you start building things from scratch or do you use something that already exists? What what would you decide at this point? Something that already exists, right? So there is this concept in machine learning called as transfer learning. Imagine how many of you write reviews on Amazon, Flipkart. If you're not happy with the product, generally that is the case. Yeah. So you will have two main categories of reviews, right? You will have positive reviews and you will have negative reviews on any particular product that you buy. Now, my company decides that, hey Bhavish, let's, let's do one thing, let's not have a classifier that only classifies reviews into two categories, positive and negative. Let's have a classifier that classifies into four categories, positive, negative, neutral, and sarcastic, for example. I'm just making up four different classes, but there are times that people have uh, kind of uh, mentioned that uh, this particular uh, toothpaste is so great that uh, it kind of made my teeth more black. So this is like a clear sarcasm, right? So uh, how do you detect? So it's not a positive review. It doesn't fall into a negative review. It's pure plain sarcasm, right? So how do you detect such uh, cases as well, which is where you take an existing pre-trained model that was used for sarcasm detection. Again, I'm giving a very high level idea. Ideally, you would create four classes and create something from scratch. But in the case of transfer learning, uh, the outputs that you see there are two classes, positive, negative. You feed in some input variables or input features. In our case, it would be text. What you do in case of transfer learning is the skeleton will remain the scale, will remain the same because you're using the same set of features that are existing when you pass in the input and you add the output layers to it. So I want four classes as output, positive, negative, uh, neutral and sarcastic. So this will, this will be my four classes. There are different way, versions of how you can do transfer learning as well. One way is you retrain say five layers from the output. One way is you only retrain the output layer which is what I will cover today. So this particular section that you see, these set of weights initially would be randomly initialized. This particular model, right? So when you are taking an input, passing it through this particular model and taking a prediction, the entire model has learned the weights for the output connections as well, right? Which is this particular case. What I'm doing is I'm chopping off this region. I'm only taking the skeleton and I want to retrain this area again without tampering this particular region, okay? This is where transfer learning comes into picture. You can iterate over how many layers you want to retrain based on the performance that you see in the model. But ideally, uh, what I want to do is I want to obtain a pre-trained model. I want to chop off the final layer because I want to do it for certain sets of classes. Uh, once I've frozen some layers, uh, I train the new data set that I have with, res with respect to this particular model so that using back propagation, I'm able to learn the new weights of the final layers. I validate how good the model is. If I'm satisfied with the performance, I stick to, I stick to that model. 
if I'm not satisfied, I'll chop off some more layers and I'll retrain it again. Okay. So this is the idea that you uh, have to follow. And this is something that I spoke about, right? So I'll stick to an image classification task again because that is something that we've seen so far. Uh, technically, whatever model I was using, so the layer that you see that has been crossed, this is the actual classifier la uh, layer where you have uh, connections in between and then you have the final output layer which is the softmax layer. I chop off that layer and I add a new layer, okay? But what is the task? The task in hand is, I have some set of images with me. Uh, uh, these images fall into five classes. All of them are uh, basically flower categories. So you have sunflowers, you have daisy, you have dandelion, you have tulip, and you have uh, roses, right? Okay. Now I want to create a classifier based on these five classes of images that I have. Again, this is entirely open source, you will find this data set on the TensorFlow website. So these are the five classes. Uh, one good thumb rule that you have to remember is once you have a data set in hand, uh, try to have a data set which is equally labeled. So you should have approximately the same number of images for every class. Otherwise, if, if you have, uh, if you're training, for example, a, uh, a spam classifier, right? If you have 99% images, which are 99% emails which are not spam, and 1% emails which are spam, then detecting spam, uh, the classifier wouldn't be able to detect spam that uh, accurately, right? So uh, here is where you see almost equal distribution with some uh, more images on dandelion, which is still fine. Now, how do I start the process? I have the images in this particular, say, website. It's a, uh, it's a zip file, tgz file is again a zip file. So I kind of download that particular uh, zip file. I store it into a, a folder called as flower photos. Uh, then I define certain things. Uh, I define the batch size equal to 128. Again, it's all dependent on how big a GPU you are using for retraining. Uh, image width and image height, again, is 24. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, so that I'm, I'm sure everyone's awake. Uh, why is it 224 cross 224 and why not some other random value, right? When you say HD in YouTube, it's a 1080p uh, screen, right? You have uh, 1080p uh, columns and you will have some amount of rows or I may be calling it the other way around as well. But why is this 224 comma 224? Is this like my lucky number or something that I'm using this and not any other value? <coughs> One at a time. Size of the Why is it 224? Why not some other value? I think it's 256. No, no, I'm, I'm correct in terms of what I've chosen here. The model that you mentioned. Yeah, perfect. I got an answer here. So, technically, when you use a TensorFlow Hub based model, it will always specify the input that it expects. Uh, some models are okay to ex accept any input image, but some models are specific in terms of what the input size is which is where I've chosen 224 comma 224. So yeah, I mean, that is the reason. Uh, I've defined batch size equal to 128. If you have like a normal GPU, which can handle okay, okay kind of a load, then you can lower down the batch size. If you, high, if you have a high end GPU that you use for gaming, then you can up this value to 256 or 512 as well. Uh, then I've uh, defined a pre-processing step wherein I'm passing in this particular data root or the folder name and passing in the validation split. So when you're creating an ML model, it's always good to validate while training so that you're not overfitting the model. Uh, so here, 80% of the data in that particular uh, say set cut that I use for training, I'll be using 20% out of that 80% into validation. Uh, and then I keep a seed value. Uh, the seed value is important. If you have to reproduce the entire same process at your end, then seed really helps to uh, create that same harmonized data cards that are happening in both the systems. Uh, then I define the image size and batch size. And here if you look at the model that I'm using, it's called the feature extractor model. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be very clear here. But there are two sets of models that TensorFlow Hub will provide. One is the actual predictor model. The other is the feature extractor model. Feature extractor, if you go back to what I showed you, is the skeleton of the model without the final layer. So just for reference, so that everyone's clear, 
the feature extractor is this blue uh, structure that's there. That's your feature extractor because it contains a lot of features for those 1000 classes. I want only those features in my model and I'll retrain it. I'll retrain the last layer with the five classes that exist. Okay. Finally, I define a sequential class which is used for creating a model and if you look at the last line of that sequential class, what I have mentioned is a dense layer that simply means the outputs that are coming in from the last feature extractor layer, all of them are connected to the five outputs that I have. So here if you see number of classes, number of classes are five. Okay. So now I, when I call model.summary, uh, these are the total number of parameters that are there in the model which is around 2.2 million or uh, 2.2 million right 22,5,7,9,8,4 so yeah 22,57,984 so 2.2 million approximately that is the amount that I have in terms of uh, my model parameters these model parameters are the ones that change during back propagation but if you look at this particular value here total parameters are 2.26 million total trainable parameters are 6405 from the final feature layer to the five classes that are there when you connect all of them together you will have 6405 parameters that I want to train the non trainable parameters are 2.257 which is the actual model uh, model that you don't want to play around with you want to just use the features take the output and through back propagation <coughs> modify the weights of the final layers okay finally i call the model.compile function uh, wherein i define the optimizer i define the loss so loss is basically used to then identify where how much of my predictions are going wrong and through that it will keep updating the weights and then i fit my data uh, finally this is the plot that i observe so if you've ever trained an ML or a deep learning model, uh, you would see you would see that the loss will keep going down after every iteration, and the accuracy would keep going up. Again, it all depends on the matrix that you are chasing. Uh, you can use either accuracy, precision, recall, or the other matrix that are there. So finally, I'm very happy with the model. I have an 87% accurate model, which works really well on unseen data. This is the confusion matrix. You basically have to, how do you identify where your predictions are going wrong, where your predictions are going right. So some places, say for example, uh, some roses have been misclassified as tulips uh, and some sunflowers have been misclassified again as tulips. So uh, now uh, we have the model in hand, right? But if you remember the title of the talk, it's all about creating a web application using the idea that you have. So we've reached a stage in the idea where we have the model ready, we've used, again if you notice the entire chain that I followed, I've taken something that already existed, I have a data set that I wanted to fine tune my model on and once I have everything in hand, now I have a model in hand without building it from scratch, I have a model that is around 87% accurate on testing data, right? Now here is where again the power of open source comes in. You have multiple uh, open source libraries like Streamlit. So Streamlit has gained a lot of popularity in uh, showing, showcasing uh, the power of your machine learning models. Then you have Gradio which is widely used uh, with Hugging Face. So they got acquired by Hugging Face and uh, there are multiple demos that you can create using this particular library. <laughs> so imagine whatever lines of code that you are seeing. Okay? These many lines of code are required to create an entire web application that takes in a machine learning model, takes in your input image and gives out a prediction in one web application. So I am importing Gradio as GR, there is one function that I have created, there are two variables that I have created for input and output and there is one line of code that I have written for creating an interface. So total only one three lines for the function, two, three, four, five, in six or seven lines of code, I am able to create a web application that helps you make an inference on machine learning models, okay? So predict image takes the image, 
makes a prediction and returns the images returns the probability of the image uh, probability of that particular image lying in the different classes that are there uh, i define input and output which is image and label and finally i create an interface as well uh, can anyone guess this which flower this is out of the five classes that i have mentioned don't mention something that's totally different uh, just the five classes if i pass this through the machine learning model what will this give me there was sunflower there was tulip uh, we had dandelion we had rose and we had some other flower as well is this a sunflower by any chance no dandelion no this looks like a tulip right no okay let's let's uh, let's clear the confusion i'll kind of run through the web application that i've created in the previous step wild rose yeah so rose is the only remaining candidate so this has to be rose hopefully so this is the web application that you would see once you write those seven to eight lines of code pretty uh, bare bone level web application like seven lines of code will give you this you can add custom css in your uh, web application as well once you want to customize that so here it's created an input section wherein you can upload an image so i go ahead and i upload this particular image i press on submit so if you want to create like a bare bare bone version of a web app you can use this if you want to customize it there are customizable options available in this particular library as well so when i press submit it will give me that this is basically a rose as compared to the other classes that are there which is sankash daisy tulips etc uh so yeah i mean uh, this is all that i had for today i wanted to show you how you can reach from the idea stage to the end implementation stage you can create your own machine learning model using the data that you have once you have the model ready how do you use open source libraries like gradio and create a web application that you can easily deploy on various cloud services like gcp or aws and uh, make your boss or make your customers and customers happy okay so this is all that i had i hope this was not very technical however hopefully it gave you an idea in terms of what all you can do with machine learning and tensorflow hub uh, yeah any questions you can scan the qr if you want to learn more on machine learning etc uh, this is where i've created tons of videos as well so you can check that out as well but yeah happy to answer questions that you have yeah not very specific to what you're talking but you did mention about cs uh in why you're generating So I have been working on this standard deviation for last six months. Out of curiosity, uh, I have been working with three more than so I am using C a lot. But it has I, I have never been able to understand how it works because these are two different machines, right? And if the C was storing the steps, it took or something somewhere, and then we are using that, I would understand. But you can give anything as a C. How does this complex thing again recreate in a different thing using this particular? seed value right yeah. so seed in case of stable diffusion along with rebooting works differently as compared to seed value that i showed you so when you use a random function in say python right so random uh, function without any seed value will randomly generate values every time you call the seed function or whatever functions you use in python which are randomly generating numbers without the seed your random output and my random output will be totally different okay when i keep a seed value which is say 131 or your lucky number is well the the values the sequences will always be the same between the machines because that is where the seed value comes in so the seed in case of pure ml or deep learning based use cases is where you want to synchronize the sequences that are generated for me as well as you if i give you this piece of code without if i give you this piece of code without the seed value and the same set of images the places where the model will make a split will be different in both the cases which is where the accuracy number that you see will be different when i give you the seed value that i'm using along with the seed value that you are using if both of them are same i'm pretty sure if you're using the same data set uh which is this particular data set along with this particular process you will also get the same accuracy number as compared to what i am getting so that number will remain the same when you use it in the context of say machine learning and deep learning what happens in say dream booth as well as stable diffusion is 
you so again what happens in that case is you pass in text it goes to a latent space and then that image is generated right now you want to control what kind of features you are generating from that latent space which is where this particular seed value comes in so if you've noticed if you use the same seed value and if you keep running it again and again the same images are not generated so it fixes some amount of the latent space in terms of what type of features to target when it's generating the image but it will never give you the same image so that is where that seed is different as compared to this particular seed value Cool. Uh, any other question? Would the model then use offline or are they just required to break the image? Uh, when you say offline, like uh, offline, then I have break it. Yes, so yes. Now I just take the model file and use it as well. That's not possible. Yes, yes. So basically, what you would do is you would save the model and then make or uh, uh, basically use it for prediction. Uh, if you want to continuously monitor it, then you can have like an entire. MLOps pipeline to monitor the output. Again, these images are very constant, right? A rose will look like a rose until unless a new breed of rose comes up, right? So technically, you don't need to retrain such models very frequently. But for say uh, a case like say a loan application, uh, loan approval process, right? If you've created a model wherein uh, the features keep changing, right? People's habit keep changing, like. 10 years before, not many people were so keen on taking loans, right, uh, or having credit cards, right. So people's behavior changes, which is where the data keeps changing, the prediction values keep changing. How do you adjust your model to keep, take into account the latest things that are coming up? Uh, a live example in case of, say, CPG would be uh, during COVID, right, uh, Ecom saw a surge in terms of the overall offtakes that were happening or how much sales we were seeing in the platform for Colgate, right? Post-COVID, now we've again come back to pre-COVID era in terms of the sales that are happening. So all the investments that we made during COVID were all about brand building. So now if we use, say, a forecasting model and if we take into account uh, the spike that we saw during COVID, then we would get not that accurate results, right? So either we have a feature or a column which says that this was during the COVID era and this is during the non-COVID era to distinguish both of them, both time periods. But if that is not the case, then I would get misleading results, which is where uh, having like a loop which checks the output and then manipulates it again and again will kind of uh, give us accurate predictions as we keep moving forward. I have one more so you already mentioned this is like a GitHub, right? GitHub yes, one, yes. Uh, so I train, I expect it, I train it with a new set of inputs. I submit it back. At the same time, somebody else also takes the same model out, trains something, and now both of us are checking it. Yes. Uh, how does it handle the function? So technically what happens is you will have two versions in terms of what you want to use, right? So again, if you are you uploading it, chances are you might have two different sets of images as well, right? So think of it this way. If you have a TensorFlow model and uh, there's one uh, GD friend of mine who is, whose name is Sayak, Sayak Paul, right? What he's done is he's taken a lot of models available on TensorFlow Hub. He's used quantization to kind of create a TF Lite version of those models and he's uploaded them. There the conflict is not happening because both the, even if two people upload the model, it will be same because he's used quantization where he's converted like a float 32 value into an int 8 value and then he's uploaded the value which is where he's compressed the size of the model but he's not lost the accuracy significantly. In such cases there's very little conflict that you would see because you've just narrowed down the weight representations. If you're retraining it and then re-uploading it, chances are you're using a different data set altogether as compared to what the other person is using. So there can be two versions available that end users can decide based on what they see fit based on the data set that you've used for retraining, but they won't be uploaded into the same repository. And all of this is again finally approved by Google as well. So if this has to fall into the official Google certified model, then Google will kind of validate the results, they'll check if the model consistency is there or not, and then they'll kind of verify the model. So yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. Maybe you 
change tensor flow model from tensor flow to light? How much is the accuracy loss in general? So it again depends on the kind of model it is, right? So if it's a huge model, if you're trying to compress it, uh, it again depends. There's no certain number that I can give you that if you convert from a 500 MB model to a 5 MB model, uh, you will have a 3% significant loss. Uh, this is where I think it all depends on how the model has been trained. If there are connections which have very irrelevant information between them, uh, there's a concept called as pruning as well, wherein you can kind of remove connections which are irrelevant uh, in the entire network. With that approach, what will happen is, uh, you cutting short on the model size and yet you're not compromising on the accuracy as well. But if there are weights which are significant in terms of the predictions that you make, and if you then lower their say resolution from float 32 to say int 8 or something of that sort, then there are chances you would significantly reduce. So there's no one number that I can quote, but again it all depends on how much. So there's always a trade-off, right? You can have a really small model with not so great accuracy. You can have a little larger model with a good enough accuracy. So this is like a trade-off that you can make. Sure, sure, sure. So thank you so much. I yeah, I mean, uh, I hope you enjoyed the session and you got a gist of how uh, TensorFlow Hub works. Okay, cool. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Devendra Shinoy. He is a systems engineer. He likes to build stuff. He is more of a doer than a thinker. He likes to think about the systems we live in, the challenges we face, and the solutions we can create. He works on Rust code bases that span everything from personal CLI to edge computing services built for the future of IoT devices in Rust. Uh, please give a round of applause for Mr. about asynchronous uh, programming uh, with some trust included because I needed a language to and uh, okay I won't waste much time in proving to you that I am a frustration okay. so that's a, a whole community of people who are like weirdly attracted to a crap based programming language right it's called rust yeah, so that's me. Uh, I work at a company called PyT, right? We are building IoT solutions. So uh, basically, nowadays you have all these devices like EVs, uh, smart mixer grinders, all these devices coming up. Uh, we basically support the companies building the hardware to collect data, right? From remote areas, God knows, uh, unreliable internet, all this. Yeah. Uh, so at Bytebeam, I maintain two open source projects. One is called MQTT, which is an MQTT library. MQTT is uh, basically a protocol for data transfer over very unreliable internet. Uh, and Uplink, which is basically trying to be the uh, solution that runs on your device. And you don't have to think much about, but somehow, is very reliable, right? So if you want to talk about that, we can meet later. 
uh, on Twitter, Instagram, on all my socials, it's just Dev Shinoy. Uh, yeah. And I run a community of Rustations out of Kerala called Kerala Rustations. Uh, that's our Telegram link if anyone's interested. I don't know. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so I, uh, I would like to first start in the starting itself point out that 15 minutes is not enough for talking about asynchronous programming. Uh, especially not to talk about asynchronous in Rust because not many people have the context of Rust itself. But still, like this is just an introductory talk, uh, trying to get you all interested. And hopefully, you guys will try looking at the resources. Right, that's the Tokyo tutorial. That's the async book. I, I can't point to links right now. Neither have I had the chance to include a QR code. But do try to get there. Right. Okay, uh, before that I'd like to point out that there will be a lot of diagrams in this talk, right? I've tried to make it as illustrative as possible so that uh, it's not boring, like that's not many words, that's not many, that's not much code, right? Because even though programming is all about uh, code, it's better when it's illustrated, right? Okay, uh, and I'm using this very great tool called Excalibur, so if at least, if nothing else, you get to take away that uh, there's a tool that helps you build all these kinds of awesome illustrations. Okay, uh, so in programming, you write programs, right? And as Anne had earlier told us, we think of t uh, everything as imperator, right? It's all like you give it a command, the computer executes it. Give it a command, the computer executes it, right? Computers think in those terms only. They only know how to do stuff at that moment. They don't know much about, oh, I am doing this, I am doing that. They just do things that you tell it to do, right? Uh, but then what happens is you need to do a lot of heavy computation and you don't have the time to let it do it over like long stretches, right? Which then you will basically be sitting on your computer waiting for uh, an ICT, re uh, ICT registration and it will take you years and years to get a ticket. That's not how it works, because computers now can do multitasking, right? The server then doesn't have to wait for all the other registrations that came before you to happen. They can just do it at the same time, right? And uh, yeah, so in computing, multitasking happens in two ways, right? That's the parallel way of doing things, where basically multi-core, right? You have multiple cores, and each core does a task. And if both tasks are long running, Right? They'll basically look like two parallel lines, two parallel lines of execution happening at the same time. Uh, inside computers, that's not enough. Right? Two cores means you can only do two tasks. An operating system itself is basically a task. Right? So if an operating system is a forever running task, it basically clocks the computer, uh, you don't get to do anything else. Uh, that's when people came up with the concept of concurrency. Right? Concurrency, as you know, is how human beings also work, right? We do a task, when we are waiting for something to happen, we switch to another task, right? That's not as a job switch or a job stealing, whatever, right? Basically, concurrency are of also multiple types, right? And that's where threads came about, right? Have you heard of the concept of thread? Not the Twitter alternative. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So that's how operating systems allowed you to do multiple tasks or multiple processes at the same time, right? They switch between threads, where threads are basically uh, an abstract uh, concept, right? Uh, that allows you to uh, run on two or like usually you have only two cores, right? Dual core systems or like quad core systems. They only have limited number of cores. And to ensure that you're using these cores efficiently, the operating system allots the core and to that task according to a scheduling algorithm like round robin or whatever, right? So that's what's happening here, concurrency. Concurrency is of also of two types, right? There is uh, cooperative concurrency, and there is the non-cooperative or the uh, preemptive type of concurrency. Uh, yeah, so threads is basically preemptive, right? It preempts or it stops 
uh, something that's happening right now and it says I'll keep you in the stack and get back to you later, right? That's how threads work. If you have a task which is happening at a time, right? And you have an interrupt or something more important to do at that point of time, the operating system is basically told to stop you and then give importance to another guy to get run. Right? Basically how all these uh, netas go, uh, go along the roads, they stop you, <laughs> they, they take over, right? Uh, that's how threads work in the operating system realm. Uh, I have an illustration for this, probably better, right? You have two cores, right? And the operating system allows you to run about, I don't know, like thousand threads or whatever, right? And these threads, the context, all the information that is necessary for the threads to run is all stored in memory. Uh, but there is some cost to it, right? It's not like you can have like billions of threads, right? That is what people found out when they started building servers that are multi-threaded, right? At a certain point, they found out uh, if you have an HTTP server running on your system, and it took like each connection got a thread of its own. What happens then is basically when you're switching between these connections to handle these connections, right? Uh, you are doing a lot of over. You you are having to deal with a lot of what is known as overhead, right? For each connection, there is a certain state information related with it, like which uh, IP address this information is coming from, uh, where should I send it, all that kind of uh, uh, information is known as context and sometimes that context is not a good thing, right? And that's where the concept of green threads or what we are going to talk about, asynchronous programming comes up, right? Asynchronous programming is the cooperative way of doing, pro uh, of doing multitasking inside your programs. Where you can have, like in the case of a uh, server, as I just mentioned, each connection can get its own asynchronous context, right? And those asynchronous context, you don't have to wait for like, uh, for a thread to get opened. Like, inside the operating system, you have a single process and inside the process, you get to manage which uh, context gets to have uh, preference over the other depending on if they are yielding, right? That is where the cooperative part comes in. A guy is like, okay, I'm running on this track right now. I Please wait for me. The moment I am done with running on this track, you can take over, right? That's the concept of cooperative. Like, I, I'm relieving myself for a few seconds. You can take over. Uh, yeah, like, that's a... That's deeper context to this. You need to uh, research it on your own. We don't have the time right now. Yeah. So let's talk about keywords, right? When you're talking about operating systems, sorry, uh, when you're talking about programming languages, keywords matter. And uh, two keywords that are important in the syntax for writing asynchronous programs is async and heavy. So here what happens is async is basically telling the compiler that we are defining an asynchronous block or an asynchronous context within which all the information inside it has to be stored separately, right? It's not as a future, right? Every time you create an asynchronous context, it becomes a future. And a future has to be resolved, okay? So these are all abstract concepts. I'm just trying to get it all into a 15 minute talk. Anyways, uh, and then every. Right? Once you have an asynchronous context which is known as a future, you await that future to resolve. That's what happens with await. It is telling the compiler that let's evaluate this and the moment that you uh, are done with it, give it back to me. Right? Give, it, uh, give the result of that operation back to me. So here what happens is we are telling the uh, operating, the, telling the program basically block on a hello world asynchronous context, right, within which we'll first sleep. For 30 seconds, we'll sleep, and the moment those 30 seconds are over, we'll get back to printing hello world. In that duration, the, the reactor or the runtime is free to choose between other asynchronous tasks. Okay. That's very abstract, like not much information there, but still. Those are the keywords that we'll be working with in asynchronous programming, right? And this is what a runtime looks like. A runtime is basically an operating system, right? A, an operating system that is running within your program, 
right? And that, and your process, your program has uh, something that is choosing between tasks and threads, right? Task is someone who wants a resource. What is that resource? That resource is a thread, right? If someone has to run on a thread, they have to first go to the reactor and the reactor has to choose them and allot them a thread, right? That's the basics of what's happening inside a runtime. The runtime is the operating system of asynchronous programming. Okay, let's consider two tasks, right? There is task one and there is task two, okay? So this is where the illustration started. Right? Uh, when I was first starting out with programming async, right, I went into a lot of, uh, I don't know, black holes. Uh, basically, I did not understand why the program was working in those very weird and like uh, unthought of manner. Right? So let's consider it in illustration terms. You have two tasks, there is task 1 and there is task 2. And as you can see, task 1 takes more time than task 2 to complete. You'd say that you'll write the program like this, right? Where you have task 1 and you have task 2, which are two async contexts, right? Futures. And then you await on those futures. What happens here is actually, you're running task 1 to completion and the moment task two com task 1 completes, you go back to task 2, right? Actually, here it does not matter if you're not doing anything in this time, right? Like, probably the, probably resources are being utilized only up till here and, up, and till here you're waiting for something to happen. Like the operating system is doing something with the file, the file is locked. And until that uh, until that file is unlocked, you can't do anything. So here, basically, the process is doing nothing. Right? The same with task two. It is doing something uh, where it needs a resource to get unallocated or like free. And for that reason, those are lost time blocks. Right? CPU cycles which are being wasted. So asynchronous Rust or asynchronous programming in general is not enough. You need to also think in terms of the asynchronous, uh, the whole program flow. If the code is going to run from 0 to 100, right? So you can see here. So essentially, uh, the whole program goes from 0 to 100, right? Task 1, and then starts from scratch for T2, right? So task 1 and task 2 take T1 plus T2 seconds to complete. This is very naive way of programming in async, uh, async await, right? This is how I used to program when I started. So it's always a, a great nostalgic feeling when you know all these uh, things you used to do in your core teens of programming. Okay, and that's when I first understood, like, or started to explore how to do different types of asynchronous programming uh, concepts, right? Like spawning, similar to thread spawn, right? Where you create a separate uh, asynchronous thread or a green thread and run it in that thread. So here you're basically doing a background task. You spawn it into a background thread, similar to spawning into a back, background thread. You run the task 1, right? it, complete, it completes in t1 seconds, and task 2 has already completed in t2 seconds. right? But the problem here is you are not getting the final result of it out of this. right? You are not able to get it out, it's all in the background green thread. You don't have control over the final results. You can like basically print to std out or some other place, right? store it in a file, all of that you can do. Uh, and also in uh, operating, in uh, web servers, basically a connection can be served in T2 seconds without having to wait for T1 to come. Okay. So that helps you a lot. But that's not enough. What if you have to do like two tasks, right? 
and get the fastest result first. Right? So here you have select, which basically says whoever is the first to get here first, right, gets to win the race or like gets to be chosen. So the moment T2 resolves, we are we are stopping waiting for T1. Right? T1 the task gets basically cancelled. And as you can see here, T2 the whole task resolves, we get T1, uh, the results of T2, T1 we don't need anymore. Right? So here if you look, it's kind of like a race. The first one to win the race basically finish. Sorry, the first one to finish a race becomes the winner. That's the concept of join, which is similar to thread join. Right? Here you are not telling the operating system, you are telling the reactor or the runtime which is, which is all within your con uh, within your control, within the user space of in programming terms, right? There's a kernel space, there's a user space. It's all in the user space. And here you can see, oh, I unknowingly said select, it's supposed to be joint. But yeah, uh, you have two tasks and you are waiting for both tasks to complete. But Unlike what we saw earlier, where we were completing T1 and then going to start T2, here T1 and T2 both start at the same time. So you are completing it in just the longest uh, time that it takes for a task to complete it. Right? So they are just waiting for T1 to complete. <coughs> because T2 was already completed in that meantime. time. Right? So that's join. You have to, even though task 2 has completed, you are waiting for T1 to complete so that you can resolve. You can return the result of both operations. So that's the join, select, all the other stuff. Okay. Okay. Some not so important, but still like taking you into the code, uh, trying to look at what's actually happening, right? So when you create an async context, we are creating a future, right? Here, the future is just this is just a behavioral. Uh, just showing you the behavior of what's happening with the future, right? You have an output. So you are supposed to get that output out of it. So the output could be anything. It could be, uh, I don't know, like, any examples. A number, something. Okay? And that's a function, poll. Right? Poll, what it gets is pin, right? Basically, in the stack, you have a stack in a same context. You have to pin it to a stack. You have to store it in a stack, right? And load it later. And for that reason, you're using pin. And then you have a mutable reference to the object, the object that you're actually storing it. And there's a whole thing of context. So the operating system of your process is basically the runtime, right? And the runtime here is passing a context, and you can evade the return of that future. The future, when the, mo the moment the future returns, you will get the item. Okay, final slide. <laughs> yeah. So streams. Uh, have you heard of the concept of iterators? Yes. You can iterate over something. Similarly, in asynchronous terms, you have streams. Right? You, you could look at it as basically waiting for something to finish in loop, right? So, uh, so one way of looking at streams would be streams of connections that are incoming, right? The moment you have a new connection, you are awaiting that connection uh, for the next connection. That's what's happening here, right? You are awaiting that stream result with next. Yeah, I hope it was not too deep. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Shenoy. Uh, now we will have lunch break. The lunch is served there outside near restaurant, in the restaurant. So volunteers are there to guide you. Uh, and before the lunch, uh, I would like to request you all that we'll have a group picture outside. So please gather there. There are volunteers to guide. Yeah. Thank you.
parts, in parts and audio. Audio is very helpful. Are feeling sleepy. Everyone in Goa. <laughs> is yeah, this is Goa, siesta. Yeah, siesta time. Let's go, let's get back to our place. Good night. Thank you for coming in. So, uh, today. So, uh, I mean, I, I think the uh, menu okay for this uh, lunch. Because I'm a selfish person and I like it a lot. I'm feeling more sleeper than you, I believe. So, so please take a seat. So uh, now we are having a panel discussion, and the uh, topic is role of cost in shaping India's future. So I, I me and Renju uh, had uh, started talking about Goa cost, and so I I'm going to be sort of. Delhi, but I went to Bangalore for a meeting where we uh, were talking about how cost can be used to help non-profit organizations. Uh, there were there were seven eight NGOs uh, participated in that, and my flight was late uh, a night before that, and I reached in Bangalore at 4 a.m. and the morning the meeting started at I think 2 p.m. So I couldn't sleep that night, and I was in the uh, meeting all time just saying yes, yes, yes. Uh, and at the, at the end of the meeting, we had a dinner. Renju, uh, that's when I met Renju. She uh, is based out of Goa. And I was like, oh, are you based out of Goa? Let's go to a Goa boss. Uh, the, the idea was to have a beach boss. Uh, and every year, every time we'll rotate to a different city with the same name. But we were like, no, we'll do a Goa boss too. We'll do beach boss in Goa as well. So uh, now coming to the topic. Uh, we have uh, three panelists in the panel discussion. We have Renju, she is the CEO of Tech for Good Community. She'll explain more uh, in the introduction round. We have Vipul, he works for UNICEF. He is also sleepy like me uh, that night, that evening. Yeah. Uh, we have Frederick, he has, a, he has already given a talk today. So I'll just pass the mic for them uh, to introduce. Thank you, Vishal. Hello, everyone. My name is Rinju. I am from Tech for Good Community. It is an organization that's been working for the last six years to build awareness, you know, improve capacity, as well as look at solutions and implementations, uh, primarily focused on NGOs. There are over 30 lakh nonprofit organizations in India, and our focus has been to kind of play that extended campaigning and support role. Uh, and improve their own capacity so that they don't always have to depend on external resource and have, who also wouldn't have that kind of budget to be able to run and do the work that they do and they work on some of the toughest development challenges and that's been the organization that I've been a part of. Thank you. And as you rightly said, I'm extremely jet lagged. Uh, I'm coming from 12 and a half hours time zone shift. So excuse me if I fumble across my words. I'm Prithal, I work with UNICEF Office of Innovation where I lead open source. Uh, part of my job is about setting standards and policies for how we use open source, how we promote open source, and what UNICEF is doing in this space. But also I work with a lot of countries and companies, country offices, and trying to tell them exactly what's the right way to do open source or how to be a model open source project, right? And that can be anywhere from choosing the right license for your business model, business strategy, to having setting up the right communities, or how do you work approach with those. Before joining UNICEF, I used to work with Red Hat. I think a lot of open source folks would understand and know Red Hat. I used to develop Fedora project and CentOS. Uh, these are Linux operating systems, so I'm very close to that. A lot of platform engineering. And I'm also in Fedora Council as their DEI advisor, so I'm very much uh, passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion in open spaces, uh, sustainability of general software, and something that our panelists mentioned, how do we do more cross-border collaboration and not spend time in reinventing the wheel? How do we adopt uh, solutions, how to do more cross-border collaborations to reduce redundancy and do more software good. Uh, reach the unreachables using open source. I truly believe uh, this is coming out of Stephen Jacobs, who is director of Open at RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. Digital infrastructure is human infrastructure. And we need to do digital infrastructure which is revolving around children, women, and general humanity. And how do we use open source to reach the most unreachable and vulnerable communities? So excited to talk in this panelist. And I I came here again as you, as you know, jet lag. 
mostly to hear the panelists, and I was invited in the panel at the last discussion. Very excited to be here. I I live in Bamburi, very close, short drive from here, and yeah, very excited to meet Goan Pass community. And at one point, I will definitely do a for the Fedora project uh, community dinner or just generally meeting and doing more Pass. Thanks. Uh, people are fed up of me saying I am not a techie, but that's a fact. And uh, you know, I've, 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 I've come a long way in a certain sense. In the 80s, we were the guys who were protesting about the influx of computers into the newspaper industry because we felt it would kill our jobs. Uh, I've been using the technology a lot, very intensely, maybe ineptly, but I feel very strongly that, see, uh, Whatever we do in life has to have some benefit from someone else. That's when we feel the most satisfaction about our jobs. Whatever we earn will come and go, but the satisfaction we get from a job done well, job done well, is enormous. And as techies, you all are very well placed and privileged. See, the Indian techies should not be underrated. Don't think that India is not contributing to Linux. We cannot do it. Someone in the West is doing it. You are sitting on a on the mine, gold mine, and if you all use that even one tenth of that knowledge you have to doing something which has impact. It will have a huge, huge kind of uh, snowballing effect. And uh, somewhere along the line, I put together a small experiment called Bytes for All. As I was telling someone, the name also was copied from another group called Access for All, which was in the Netherlands. But our job was very simple. We were not techies, so we kept collating the experiences of others and just creating a simple e-newsletter, e which was plain text, plain text newsletter, not even HTML and sharing it around and uh, people really appreciated the kind of work that was going on no? and we kept reporting on it. So if you, what the mind does not know, the eye does not see. So if we start looking for these experiments, we will find lots of them. The old letters are all somewhere scattered around on the internet, you can find them. And uh, at one stage, I'm not boasting, but we were ahead of the mainstream press because the press is looking for press notes and those kind of things and they, they're not, they're not aware of what is going on here. So my humble request to you all is, take on these big challenges that will make a difference in your lifetime, may not be in my lifetime, for the country as a whole, because we have these skills which the country needs very bad. Export dollars we can always earn, but you will never get that satisfaction which you get for making a difference to people's lives, whether it is journalism or whether it's technology. Uh, thanks for the... Uh, Answer. So I also studied engineering. But uh, am I loud enough? Yes. 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 I think so, I can do that. Yeah. So I also studied engineering. Okay. But uh, before that, I always felt I should go to a literature. Uh, you know, study literature. But uh, I think a lot of here, I mean, might have uh, chosen because of you know the family and other people have believed that it's a secure uh, you know subject to study. And when I joined college, uh, for me it was, oh wow, what is this, why, why people are talking about internship? For me it was an alien word. Mm -hmm. What is uh, programming, you know, why, how, how WhatsApp works? And a lot of questions starts coming to my mind, okay. And I started wondering, uh, using internet, I started using internet, okay. And I realized, okay, there's so much thing I've never experienced, never seen before. And started meeting people, going to events in coaching. I started in coaching. And I realized, the, uh, I, I realized the fact that I have learned nothing so far in my life, 20 years, 22 years. Uh, and then that's when I started uh, organizing events, uh, creating communities in my college, clubs in my college. And I felt the need because I was in touch with a lot of people who can come and uh, deliver a good talk, help students uh, to uh, you know, learn that they can start building something. So I become a facilitator of all these events happening in college, lot of uh, city level uh, meetups in Cochin, and that's how I ended up ended ended my uh, uh, journey. Started my journey at Boston United. You know, I, I did an online hackathon in uh, before pandemic, which was nobody nobody you know even used to think about online event uh, virtual hackathons. And the point is, uh, what he mentioned, it, it's not just about uh, the salary, you know, we, we get every month. It will come and it will go somewhere, right? But the impact uh, we'll create will give us a lot of satisfaction when, you know, we are walking, when we are old and walking, you know, in the courtyard, right? So, okay, so coming back to the panel again, uh, my question to Renju. Uh, 
Okay, I'll give another story before that. So, I when I started uh, when I work, when I started working at Force United, my uh, second thing I picked was helping NGOs with the tech, and I picked ERP Next. This is one of the tool uh, open source. ERP tool uh, built by an Indian company, uh, Mumbai based company Frappe. And I started learning Frappe ERP Next. And, and I, uh, I, for, an, for I think 15 months of time, I worked with uh, dozens of NGOs. And I find a lot of difficulties working with them. I mean, the management change. Once you, uh, once it's a, we are an NGO and we are using a software. The moment uh, somebody comes and say, hey, we will help you with open source and you should do this. Maybe it looks easy from my side, okay, yeah, yeah, you should use open source, but, but the people, the manager at the NGO, they have to go through a lot of changes, uh, the way the, their, their employee use the software, the process while, you know, uh, whole software is being, being uh, customized or made, right? So my question to you is, how do you, uh, how do you deal with, uh, since you said you work with a lot of NGOs, how do you deal with this, uh, the mindset change, the adoption uh, of the software? Because it's not an easy job, uh, especially when they don't have much, especially when, not, when they don't have much budget in, in, the, in the pocket and they can't, uh, they can't, uh, and they also, uh, the, the, even the employees, right, who use it, or the, or the person who, let's say there is a, a CRA, so the person has to go through a lot of training again, unlearn, then relearn, right? Because of system change. So how do you how do you convince the NGOs to adopt FOSS? Okay, I'll I'll start from am I audible? Yeah. 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 So um, I'll start from much way ahead in upstream of how nonprofit sector generally looks at technology and the kind of organizations we have interacted with. Um, the minute you go in as we are tech for good community or we are going to uh, find out how tech plays a role in your organization, usually there is a withdrawal from the organization. Um, unless they are fairly big, has some kind of sizable budget, um, our work largely involved in grassroots organizations and finding out what is lacking there. So we are all involved in collecting data, um, storing data, visualizing it, they will have to have an MIS, etc. But the organizations we started meeting in rural Raichur and rural Thiruvallur would have tons of paper member forms. And they would have stacked it in shelves. And uh, one such organization I remember was called Chakrita Mahila Sankhane. They are in one of the poorest districts of Karnataka. They lost close to like thousands of member data during floods. And so uh, many years of work that they have done uh, they wouldn't know now how to proceed next, which funder to go to next, now that they have lost this information. So uh, this is this is one example of a kind of organization. So we can't even get into adoption and talking about that to a system like that. But then there are others who, would have, who have come to us who use, who have spent a lot of money in proprietary software. Um, the teams change. But uh, they wouldn't know who, have the, who has the login and the access and where the, uh, uh, where the analytics they are done lie in because of that kind of turnover organizations like that have. So uh, before we get into the adoption piece, we do a huge and uh, very human level interaction of t assessing their tech. And this tells us in terms of just in, in the form of a maturity of technology, where do they stand and how the organization's project management is, or how they communicate within internally in their team, externally to their stakeholders, um, where, uh, how do they make decisions because of this, etc. So tech comes in at a much, in the end point of understanding the program of work, because they are going to see organizations like a tech for good community, or a, or a lab, or a tech for dev, all of us, though the vision is aligned, uh, the fear of the minute we step in, is it going to be high budget? Then when we introduce open source and then talk about, it is a whole new world for organizations now. When they get, I mean, you are part of Oasis as an alliance and the thousand plus NGOs that we work with, very minimal awareness into what is available in terms of open source. 
and it's mind blowing the number of organizations we've helped set up ERP Next as their um, MIS or CRM systems and then introducing them to even something as simple as Google Toolbox to collect data. Um, move from paper, move from Google Forms to just do that so that your field staff can use it well. So adoption from that point of view, we try and drive it from the founder or, or, or someone who's able to make that decision, see value in it and a big part of our process is to also put out good stories of impact of NGOs who use such good technology, who are able to customize it themselves uh, and these solutions become replicable. So all these play a role in ensuring adoption becomes much more confident and easy. Uh, I also want to touch upon the role that now we are encouraging students to be part of. Um, I want to bring in this concept that the program that we launched is called Engineering for Good where we are giving paid internships for students to be part of development sector problems at that stage, whether you are a second year, third year, or fourth year engineering student, to know the kind of sector that they can also contribute their skills into. Um, and so, yeah, like the pipeline of problem statements we've collected, it's, it's really encouraging to see the turnout of kids who have applied and, and are part of this. So that's been the journey of our answer. So what you're saying, it's a very tough job. It's a very tough job and uh, you're not just hacking code, but you're hacking how society works. Yeah. Hats off, hats off to you and wishing you all success because, you know, if you succeed at even a small part of this, you can have a huge problem. Exactly, I want to add something to that. So when we talk about open source adoption in NGOs or general government organizations or inter-government organizations, there are two aspects of it. One, either we talk about the workflow adoption on how you use different open source tools for your workflow, mm -hmm. or how open, all these NGOs and government institutions should open source their research, academia content, open data, and open software. Mm -hmm. Because often they work with partners. There are challenges in both of them. So that with a lot of these companies who are trying to adopt or do open source. I've seen a bunch of them. The biggest adoption problem in the workflow is you don't, so think about Indian government, and they want to build something. The problem is they don't adopt a project, they procure a product, right? Yeah. You can't have that in open source. The biggest challenge you need to think about is, we all talk about free and open source, free as in terms of freedom of speech and not free fear. A lot of you are, might not have heard, free as in free puppy. You can adopt something, but it requires investment, it requires resources to keep it up and grow it with you. How do you talk about sustainability when you have you start using a tool, and suddenly an open source project is not active anymore. There's a sustainability challenge, there's not enough community, right? How can you keep using it? Because an NGO or a lot of these organizations are not development organizations. A lot of these companies can choose to have, uh, just assign one engineer on it and then get the product developed. But sustainability is a real question in these things. We are trying to adopt a project. Because you cannot just assign and develop something for yourself. So there's a lack of a lot of businesses around these open source pro projects who can provide me that service, okay. right? And when you talk about workflow, I like to highlight the benefits of inner source before going to open source. Anyone who has worked on open source like methodology, I always say open source is not, is way more than methodology. It's a movement, it's a culture. We all agree to that. Us coming together, talking about open source is a part of a culture, right? We are promoting open source, it's a movement that we are doing. And then opening a code request on GitLab, GitHub, and uh, any one of these online Git courses, and participating in a community opening work, those are methodologies. So highlighting the benefit of inner source before you go open source, on how it increases efficiency of your developers, efficiency of all the partners working, what's the benefit of public roadmap, how different community can come together and you give a place to the community stakeholder you're trying to solve when you work in open. That's a, another challenge that we have seen. A lot of people trying to solve something, but the people that are trying to solve, they are not part of it. So we don't have inner insight of exactly what the problem is. So highlighting benefit of how when you work in open, you give space to them to participate in the community, and then there are different efficiency benefits of it, on how you become better of it. But then when you talk about making open source tools, the bigger challenge that I've seen often people think, because I work with a lot of these companies, and they fear, oh, I have worked on this piece of source of code, and it's my IP. You are asking me to give them my IP for free? Because any OSI approved open source license does that. 
right? Bit copy that's for bit copy set. So it's very important for me to highlight the value of the position of open source. What are the open advantages of an open source project? And highlighting that most of the code written anyway nowadays, 60% is AI written. Is it truly your IP or is it the ecosystem you build around your IP? For example, I was giving it to someone like Facebook or Twitter. Even if they had their open code, open source, it's not the code that matters, it's the people who are on it. So it's the community that you build around your project and tools, be it the documentation, be it the support, be it the culture, Firefox. Anyone can take this source code to build a, build a uh, browser, but you still go use Firefox. Why? Because you know there's a forum around that. You know that there is certain promises that it's going to keep getting better. So highlighting the benefits of open advantages and then talking about business strategy around open source. Going more than open source IP on how you build an ecosystem around it. Choosing the right licenses around it. Because again, different kind of business strategy will have different licenses. When you want to break through into a market which is not easy open source, a permissive is very useful. Because a banking system will not use a copyright license if they have open source their own code. Because trust me, banking system source codes are a mess. From hardware to API tokens and all the things, they are not built with best practices around it. So going copyright just because you want to follow the ethos of copyright, which I love and live copyright, you can't do that. So you need permissive. But also if you want to protect yourself from these big players just to create your source code and build a business around it, that's when you go copy it. So it's incredibly important for you to understand the business strategy, come up with what the value proposition is of your solution, and then talk about open source. Because it is true, as uh, Thales highlighted, open source is often, or technology is often uh, an afterthought. Because your goal is not to do in the software, your goal is to save children's life, and I'm coming from a municipal perspective. So how do you use tech, and how do you highlight the benefit of open source in tech? That. That's all. Thank you. So one highlight from her answer is uh, one of the highlight is uh, the program engineering for good. So for the students, if you are interested in uh, looking after you're looking for internship or part-time job, uh, you know where to reach out, whom to reach out. So yeah, coming back to Vipul. Uh, so you said uh, you work with uh, you work with UNICEF and you work on the public policy and uh, similar fields. Uh, open source policy, yes. Yes. So, uh, in the in context of India, the uh, the how how do you what do you think about public policy will shape the India's future? If uh, the government, I mean, what what should be the your your thought on this? Because it's not easy. Uh, Problem to even think of. I mean, solution to even think of. Uh, public policy, uh, a public policy which uh, force or mandate the government-funded bodies to use free and open source software. So, what 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 is your uh, answer or answer or suggestion to that? Suppose you are the advisor to the uh, secretary of the Metis. I love that. I love that. Okay, so I think it's more than just India. Let's think about generally how open source can enable your cross-border collaborations, right? How advanced sustainable development goals. Because there are a lot of solutions. If you are thinking, if when you talk open source by default, it's more than just a country development. It's a global development. Okay. When we use Firefox, it's not developed in India, but we can utilize that to empower certain Indian communities that we need. Uh, but talking about the open source policy, I really like what uh, Christopher Foundation Europe is doing with their public code, public money campaign, uh, what European money is doing. They do have, like, I don't know if how many of you are aware of the CRA that's coming out in uh, European and it's a little bit problematic policy, but they have been working on, uh, there's code.eu. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the URL, but you can actually European Union, any new code is being developed, it's open source. Right? So there are things around it. But if you think about this, take a step back and what would be the digital utopia of the government? They should not be writing code. They should be empowering their people to write code for them. Again, I'm talking about digital utopia. It's a shiny world where we don't know exactly how it is right now. Government should be describing problems they're trying to solve. You have joined hackathons, you mentioned. There are a lot of students here, they do hackathons and participate in things. Uh, if the people, if the engineering students, and if the people around the general force community, or any community, if they are participating in trying to solve the problem which actually governments need, 
but actually in the continental, like I'm not even talking about Indian government, think UN, United Nations, right? If we need some software for peacekeeping, UN should not be doing the software. What should they should be describing problem statements? And there are so many hackathons happening around people doing passionate about solving something good. As Frederick mentioned, we want to do something, everyone wants to internally, want to make an impact in the world, right? But the biggest question is, well, how do I do that? How do I know if I'm doing it right? And that's the role government should be playing. One of the bigger problems I've seen adoption is changes and differences in policy. Uh, license problems, like if there is a tool that's developed in, say, Indonesia, can Indian government really adopt it without understanding in and out of it? And that compliance and the trying to understand exactly what goes into it and what how the license structure to the documentation effect is often more work than just writing it yourself. And so many, uh, I think I was telling you, so many NGOs and uh, countries, they waste their resources reinventing the wheel, right? So how do you come up with standards which is truly really shared and people can understand that? And the same problem with open data. There are different governments, different uh, countries with different standards on what is copyright. <coughs> when we talk about data, we talk about AI. So what we need is truly really a centralized standard, shared standards, which everyone can look at and I agree with that. If there's a tool that's developed using those things, I can I can buy that. I can understand that there would be a good tool to adopt. And that's where digital public good comes into the picture. Where you have to have open source, but you need more than open source from the sustainability perspective as well. But also, how are you exactly advancing sustainable development goals? I don't care about a software that's a new media player. I care about a software that's providing quality education to children with, say, example, dyslexia, for whom the normal the education takes back on the new world. Right? I care about solutions which actually advancing sustainable development goal and reaching those who can't utilize the same thing. Because remember, 50% of the world still doesn't have access to internet. Right? So how do you reach those people and actually make an impact? So government should be setting up policies and standards that are easy to understand for researchers, engineers. I should not be worried about, am I violating a copyright? Is this actually goes against the policy? If there's a data set available, can I truly use it and build something on top of it? So setting standards and policies can empower people to participate. It removes that ambiguity where you can go and actually do something. But also, general cross-border collaboration. I think I was telling you, if a, if a solution worked in Vietnam or the Philippines in daily outbreak and there's a community in India that also requires it, how easy it is for, for us to take it, adopt it, and get it. And that's where open source becomes a key enabler for sustainable development goals. goals. So I think, uh, I really like the idea of what Digital Public Good Alliance is doing, uh, which is just a shared standard, they have a registry, and they have a, the open standards on what exactly do we mean by uh, when we say this tool is Digital Public Good. This, 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 that should have no proprietary independence, uh, proprietary dependence. If you have an open source software that is so tightly bound with AWS, is it truly can I use it and scale it? Because the, the communities that actually require it, they don't have that kind of resources. So how do you build a software that does not depend on a proprietary software? And how do you make sure that you are not collecting PIIs? And if you are collecting PIIs, which is personal identifiable information, you have a policy or you have a guideline that actually within this many days you will be or you can retract all the information. So how do you truly build digital public good right, for people to reach those people? That's where I think government should be playing the biggest role. It's just me. People power, community, we all know that how much uh, impact is that. You were talking about how hackers, so we, like initially what you have done, you have paved path for all of these corporations and governments to follow through that early hacker activism that provided the path for a lot of open source things. That's the crux of it all. So there are a lot of hackers in the world. Government should be making it easy for them to participate and empower them to do something good. Was that roughly close to your own question? Like, did I answer some of it? I don't know. I might have gotten a little too passionate. Sorry, I'm sleepy. <laughs> he, he, raised, he raised many tough questions and uh, valid questions, valid questions. But since I sometimes suspect that I suffer from opt over optimism, let me give you a dose of my over optimism. At lunch, we were talking about various philosophical issues. Do Indians contribute to global free and open source? Do we only take back from it? Why are we not doing enough? You know, my point of view is very simplistic. I think that we are still at the earlier stage of our evolution where the internet came to us not many years back. 
okay, high speed internet is a, is a modern reality, not for you all, but for us. And uh, you know, things are going to change, things are already changing. We need, we need role models, we need, we need to understand the policy problems, we need to understand cultural problems. To raise a difficult issue, uh, I think each culture has its own strengths and weaknesses and at the risk of saying a very unpopular thing, uh, maybe we in our part of the world look at knowledge as power in that sense, more than others. Whereas uh, if you look at Sweden, I'm not saying they are great, we also have our own strengths. But those guys that they, they have a history of openness, you know, going back 200 years, where uh, something like the right to information was the way, but then, uh, here things are changing, things are changing, things are changing fast. We have our strengths, we have a very strong solidarity at a social level, we have a strong sense of, uh, you know, making sure that our technology is affordable, like the Chinese, we, India and China, our two countries, we do it. But when it comes to creating and sharing, we have to prove ourselves. I'm sure we will prove ourselves, but it's taking time. It's not that it's not there, but uh, I was just saying over lunch, or, yeah, or here, you know, if, if, if your mind does not know it, we are not going to see it. So, so we have to build that faith in ourselves. But above all, I would appeal to techies to hack not only your code, but to hack society, to find solutions. To find solutions to very real life problems. The same thing you learn in engineering college can be used to any field. Just one comment, not to over speak. In my current experience, incredibly proud of Indian Boston community. We are doing a lot. We are everywhere in any open source project. If you see, there is not a world untouched by what Indian community is doing. And we are doing ever so with the fastest speed. Go check Google somewhere, of course, there is some nastiness in it with Indian community, but we are a lot. Most of, uh, if, you, if you know Outreach Project, anyone of you aware of Outreach Project? Have you, uh, yes. Go and check that. How many? Uh, in terms, how many people actually hacking on the edge cost, humanitarian free and open source software, but generally also free and open source software. India is doing it. So the party I'm here, a good one. And you said role model, we are new. We are new, we are not You know, there are people who have actually done from the start. Before I was born, OSI, the year OSI was born was my birth year. But since then, Indian has been part of it. And I, I, I travel to all of these foreign open source conferences, and one thing I see a lot is a lot of Indian faces. And not just attending, presenting and talking about on how to do what's next. But we need a national network. And yes. What you all are doing is, is a step in the right direction. Exactly. And I think that's always been a theme of open source community. A lot of bubbles doing their own thing and then connecting at, at one point, right? We have Bitcoin, we have PyCon, every year it's been happening for the last 15, 20 years, and we have so many different communities. Like there are so many different user groups all over the world, all over India. If you go to Bangalore, that's how I did it. One thing that we share, Vishal, is doing, uh, starting uh, open source club and just trying to invite people to speakers. I would go on meetups on Saturdays and Sundays and invite them in my university to talk about it. Right? So I have seen a lot of, if you're in, in Bangalore and if you try to search all the meetups happening in open source, you'll see tons of those every year. Right? So slowly we are growing, and we are growing at a very fast rate. But also, as a global south perspective, I know in India it's like right we're in, in Red Lane, but global north, mostly European and North American places, they have made a lot of mistakes. And how does global south learn from those and do it as better? I think we have that going on for us. Because look, technology, while enabler, can also destroy things. So we can do it right. We have that opportunity as well. True. So I, yeah. I'll yeah. pass the mic to us. Yes. So it's okay. I'll pick up now. So, uh, the point I was trying to understand is, uh, you said that you use uh, Google Forms, right? We had a panelist who shared TensorFlow Lite and TensorFlow. What I'm trying to understand is, as free open source community, open source is when you give the code back to the community. Both these uh, these instruments don't give code back. So I'll give you an example of Heroku. It's a free source tool, right? But they stop their operations. So there are many organizations that will depend on Heroku, right? On the counter side of that, there's something called as OpenAI. It started as an open source organization, and then they made it closed source organization. So my question is specifically to Vipul. How do you, as UNICEF, try to avoid this? So what I think, my perspective is this is, people ride on the open source wave saying it's a free software, they get the organic growth inside, they get the customers inside, and once they're at this level, they stop it off. So uh, do you educate users on this? Because there is a confusion between what is free software to use and what is a free open source software. 
but why if you look at any open source project as a service you get there often not free free service to use and free code that's a bad business strategy how do you sustain that infrastructure comes out of money so if you truly value what you are using you got to pay for it think about it google is free they are taking your data they are taking your data they already got your data that's how they are trying to get you into the big ecosystem be it vendor locking or anything right TensorFlow, though, the example you gave, is to be open source. You use it, you build it, you, you scale some, make some product, and you get Apache license, and you can change it to GPL if you wish to. But from coming from what we are doing, that's what I mentioned, Digital Public Good Alliance, DPG, Digital Public Good, we have a registry. You can go and submit your project, and it has to follow, follow nine indicators, right? I want to take a step back and actually get that question. Even if something is open source, first of all, free service, free code, how is that company making money? Does infrastructure cost money? So that's a big red flag. You need to think about what you're paying for it. Uh, and you should pay for open software to everyone. But let's say the platform independence part that I mentioned. You have an open source project, but it's dependent on a proprietary solution. You can't scale it. If I want to run my own instance of it of, without any extreme cost or without any depending on a proprietary solution, I can't do that. So the DPGA is one part that the is doing. And I will also tell you something. I'm reading open source in UNICEF and I often say we are not, we don't wish to be a tourist in this space. I'm here and we are here to participate in the community and do more open source all the time. But UNICEF is not a software company. In certain way, in traditional sense, when you think about what software is, we predate software, right? So our main goal is to do humanitarian work, medical responses, emergency responses, on ground, trying to provide schooling, education to water and sanitization, hygiene. Open source part, the technology part, is the far coordinate of what we do. On a very small scale, I think 2% of all of what UNICEF does. Right? So we are very much on field, and then we are trying to utilize technology to see how we can uh, make good of it. But if uh, that's why you need to evaluate any project, and that's where risk analysis and risk tolerance come in. Adoption question that we discuss about any NGO, and that's where I mentioned sustainability of it. It is true. If someone is adopting an open source tool, obviously you can go and work it. But then comes all the overhead on you to maintain it. So those are the challenges which truly mentioned if it exists, that you use an open source tool and it might not be open source after some time. But that's where you think about the license, the community that they have built around it, the ecosystem there is around it. For example, if I work for Federal Project, and I truly I can tell you that if we ever decide not to do Federal Project, there will be enough people, that's my personal opinion, there will be enough people to take up the community and run it. When CentOS, uh, uh, Linux, CentOS Linux, not Stream, closed their like, this was shut shop for CentOS 8, Rocky and Amal Linux came and started building from the real uh, distributions. That's where the power of community comes in. When MySQL went uh, not open source, MariaDB came in and took the place. And that's what, by default, a lot of the operating system also point to when you install MySQL, it installs MariaDB. And that's the power of the community, I would say. And again, look for the digital public good alliance. I think they're running late. Uh, so, la one last question for the panelists. Drupal for a very long time. As a result, we ended up in this non-profit thing, right? So non-profit come to the Drupal space yeah. for a while, right? So we have RQM, Azim 5G Foundation, yeah. Airtree, uh, Qatar Foundation as our client. Yeah. And then again, media used to come for a period to Drupal, and most of it failed in Drupal, I think other than news media, right? Mm. Same as some uh, organization, cultural organization used to come. So one common pattern we had by uh, using open source was uh, something we have learned now, but we have not been able to crack it. When the organization doesn't have a, let's say, a tech policy itself, yeah. right? When they don't have a tech policy, the people in position take the decision. Yeah. Right? But it's not, let's say, written on stone or something. Yeah. So the next person can easily come and replace it. Right? So I don't want to name the organization. Among these two prominent organizations, we are right now battling uh, and kind of doing their battle for them yeah. and preventing them from taking the wrong step. And uh, in two cases, the people who are taking the decision are the teachers. And what is driving the decision is a user experience. 
right? The tool like okay, we can uh, make article more easy here. We can just drag an image here and it works, right? But it's a pivotal moment. It's a very large organization with uh, some of that sites are like 10 lakh to 20 lakh visitors per per uh, month, right? And the decision of the whole tech that has so, for example, Arkham has been with us for around uh, eight years now, mm -hmm. and. They are kind of changing the whole tech stack based on an editorial, editorial experience, right? So uh, what we understood is like uh, even before, as you said, the tech is in place, there has to be a policy in place, right? But that's something beyond what a tech company can do. Right? That's not something we should be doing, or that's not something often we can even influence, right? But this is something we keep seeing in this nonprofit that we are working with. They don't have a uh, policy in place, or they don't have. Uh, like some people who was visionary has started it off, but they are no more there. And the new people who are coming are kind of, in some cases I've seen people putting Google Forms in this site, even when they could uh, just build a form yeah. using the same system. Some people are connecting, asking for integration with Google Sheet because it's easier to develop and all those, Tableau yeah. for visualization and all those things. So this is something that we, we have not seen a solution and so often we spend a lot of time fighting for them their battles, right? And, and then we fail and we feel demoralized and all those things. So how do you deal with these things? Yeah, absolutely. I'm on that. No policy, there's no tech team, there's no tech budget. So can you just repeat the question? Yeah. Like a, can you repeat the question? Okay, so his question was around uh, non-profits that he's engaged with in his experience and uh, from a policy point of view when that doesn't exist and decisions being made by like a a, a certain senior management or an idea that they have and then how that trickles down and has to go through changes because of user experience and, and the end game that happens and the changes that organizations he's interacted with has had to go, gone through. Same, same experience here as well. Um, so I was, my answer was also, uh, it's a work in progress situation for us, but uh, you are right in terms of policy, in terms of people, in terms of processes, all of those would have a lot of aberration as we have to work through. So we start on very small understanding on the first thing that we can work with uh, when there is a buy-in at that current state of the organization and that state immediately changes in three months we see new people working on that. Um, so we are trying to make it in terms of phases as much as possible. The low hanging fruit being the one that we look at first and then if we succeed using them as an example for other organizations saying even if they are small they put a tech policy in place. They are an education-based organization. So a bunch of other education-based organizations because there's a lot of peer learning. Like I, you, as soon as you said RKM or you know, like an it strikes or ATRI, uh, the, the fact that ATRI works on environment and all other natural resource management organizations generally know about them. If they know ATRI has adopted a certain CRM system, the, the curious, curiosity at least uh, is something that we bank on a lot. Um, small changes, but it's it's looking impactful, and so we just power through it. So yeah. just uh, add on, like, so as a tech company, should we push for policy change? It would be ideal that there is a lot of conversation around from different forces who are engaged with that NGO for sure. Not that um, we're overstepping. The at least the conversation is good. The thing is, they largely rely on such companies also to bring words into meetings. The minute you might say tech policy, you might not have to be fully involved in it, but the person attending or listening to this word might go back and say that didn't strike us before. They might not want you to do it, but it's good to have that kind of engagement and conversation, definitely. That's lacking a lot, so even if we can't, uh, we can't go into hire a tech person in your company, right? Or, or come back and say, we have three interns, create positions. But the fact that it would be nice to have like a database manager is a thought we do bring up. The decision is of course theirs, but that kind of community and camaraderie is very important for them also to know what decisions to make. So that's how I would approach it, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you so much. So I would like to conclude this uh, panel. Two points? Yes. Oh. yes. Just two quick points. One is that FOSS has a lot of advantages, but the uh, entry point and the learning curve is very steep. So please keep in mind that everyone who's new to it needs support, especially the non-profits. Secondly, if we can link up with affiliated movements, whether it's open access, uh, whether it's Wikipedia, whether it's Creative Commons, because 
the non-profit world has a lot to do with data and information. And all these are system movements in the sense they share a certain nature. That's all. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, it was very insightful for me and I hope it was for all of you as well. A uh, lot of learnings and I hope, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping a lot of you have questions but I know you are, uh, since we are running out of time for this, uh, we can have this, uh, you can have the questions for them after the conference, we have some key and a working time. So yeah, once again, thank you all of you, three of you for the, all of your insights and answer and hopefully we will uh, we'll keep doing more discussions like this and question open questions from the participant. Yeah, I'll ask the volunteers for the next round of talks to start with. Source contributor by contributing to the source code of open source projects during his free time. He loves 2D game programming and occasionally writes small and fun games as a hobby. Recently, he has started playing around with data engineering and exploring this new field. Uh, kindly give him a round of applause as we welcome him. Articles you will see a lot of uh, articles written in Indian languages. 
Um, so yeah, this is the same slide. Uh, it's the same thing, but uh, written in the other script. So um, the question is, why why do why is there even a need to type in your local languages, your let's say Hindi, for example? Why is there a need to type that uh, in 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 Linux? So so for for India, right? If you look at uh, the statistics, you'll see that. How many of what are the languages here? You see any missing language here? Okay. okay, yeah, of course, yeah. That's that's a good but that, that's because of population, right? Goa has a small smaller population. Uh, less than 50% speak Hindi, so Hindi is also not like the absolute majority over here. English. English, yeah. But do you think English is there somewhere in the graph over here? Oh, no. no. Yeah. Actually it's there. How much percent do you think uh, English is? Sorry? That's the correct answer. It's, it's 0.02. Very nice answer. <laughs> anyway, so, 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 so there is English. People do speak English, but not as their first language, right? And this is from census, from uh, the 2011 census. Uh, after 10 years, they do another census. I could not get 20, 21 data because, uh, COVID, because of COVID, government can't do the census survey. Anyways, let's go ahead. So, again, discussing the need for uh, localization. And Linux. Mainly, I won't read through all the points, but the uh, the, the the need is clear, right? It's 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 being more inclusive. We can reach a much wider audience. Um, we, we can be inclusive of culture. Uh, there are different cultures, there are different languages all across uh, the country, and we need to include them. So, let's say some some kid uh, studying somewhere in some remote location, some remote place in a village, might be speaking some some language that it's, it's uh, for which uh, there there's almost no almost nothing that you can just Google and read, right? Uh, it gives a better experience. Uh, you English is not your first language. You read in some other language that can be useful. Governments again, yeah, uh, there are official languages in India. Like English is one of the official languages, but there are multiple other languages which. Um, and so on, right? Uh, documentation is another thing which I think I will be talking about uh, later. I had one more point. Yeah. Anything. Anything 2020. That is? The national education, uh, education should be in the uh, mother tongue. Mother tongue, okay. Okay. That, yeah, that's, that's another great point. So, how many of you type like this? <laughs> yeah. So this is one of the problems that we are we are facing. But but the, the question is like like why do we even type like this? Like like why can't we type it like let's say give them this script or whatever? It's difficult. Yeah. Exactly. This is the problem. We use the US for most of us use US QWERTY keyboards over here. And anyone using non QWERTY layout? Everyone uses QWERTY, right? Huh? <laughs> Okay, yeah. Now, you can use any other layout, but uh, this is the main issue, right? The most widely used keyboard. No one uses the other keyboard, right? And and that's also not a not a practical solution for uh, like typing in Devanagari. So let's get a little bit into linguistics, a um, um, little bit technical. There are something called writing systems, and every language is split into uh, writing system. There's logographs, which are like uh, letters, pictures, syllabaries, which uh, every character represents a sound. Alphabets are what European languages are, which are made up of uh, separate characters for consonants and vowels. Uh, there's Akshar, which are Middle Eastern uh, characters, which are usually RTL, but they, are, they also lack vowels, so they are usually use consonants for them. And Abhogitas are uh, what Indians use, which is also a consonant vowel kind of combination, but the vowels are diacritics. We'll quickly discuss through each of these. So, the first thing is logo syllabi. Logo syllabi is more of like uh, a pictorial representation. On the top, you can see uh, it's e Egyptian hieroglyphics, and they, this particular thing says the honey is sweet. Where you can say you can see there's uh, a honey pot, a, a bee picture, and something that represents sweet. Uh, so in these kind of languages, it's hard to represent abstract concepts which you can't see, like sweet, right? So there are things like that. Again, there's Chinese, where in uh, the tree kind of looks like tree, the fire kind of looks like fire, 
and the door kind of looks like those. Right? Uh, let's go ahead. The second thing is syllabus wherein the pronunciations, uh, the character evident pronunciations. So this particular place is Kojijiwa Sakura, which is Japanese. And each character over here represents a sound. Right? And and, and I'll, I'll get a bit little bit deep into Japanese later. Um, Alphabets uh, hail from the Europe, so most of the European languages use alphabets. Uh, English is one of the most popular alphabet that we all use. Um, yeah, the first one is Greek, the second one is English, as you know. The third is Portuguese, and the fourth is Russian. Of just as I said, they are Middle Eastern, uh, so they are mostly consonants. There are no uh, vowels. Uh, recently, in the modern uh, abjads, they use vowels. So, first word is maharban, which is hello. Second is salam, which is peace. The third one is in Hebrew, which is uh, shalom. So, shalom is like it's made of here. Yeah, there are vowel uh, diacritics, but usually they write it in terms of consonants. So, it's like sh l, and m. So, those are uh, consonant sounds. And when you pronounce, you say it along with vowels. So, you say shalom. And finally, Abu Vidas, which the Indian languages uh, are written in. So, Abu Vidas are, uh, they consist, consist of consonants, and the vowels are added as diacritics uh, on top of consonants. So, let's get a little bit deep into what Unicode is. And you can actually type uh, with Unicode. So, I'll give a quick uh, demo of how to type with Unicode. So uh, you saw a table before, and there was some. Sorry. Yeah, you, you saw a table before, and uh, you saw there were some numbers written. So I'll just try to go back. I don't think I can definitely go back to that. Yeah. So this is the table, and there are some numbers. So uh, you can actually type in Unicode by referring to these numbers. I'll quickly show you how to do that, and just to show you how difficult it is. So I'll be writing ka and ki, okay, as the word da ki. You guys come over there. So this is Unicode 915. You can go. And again, another U. 93E will convert the, you add a diacritic, so the curve will become ka. And then again, ka, which is 915, and then this will be the key for which I think I have the wrong code. So imagine how difficult this is, that you have to remember all these numbers to type. So this is definitely a bad alternative, so I'll just delete whatever I wrote over here. So let's see how Japanese, so Japanese uh, rarely type in English, they type in Japanese. So let's go a little bit into that and how they use the quality keyboard that we use to write Japanese. So there, there are three scripts that Japanese use, Hiragana, Katakana, and Kanji. Kanji is basically an, a derivative of Chinese, so we'll not look into that. Uh, katakana is like um, the, the script that they use to write foreign languages, and Hiragana is the script that they use to write their own uh, languages. So this is how they write. Uh, the keystrokes map to the sounds that the letters make. So let's say if you want to write Sakura, the Sa will map to the character Sa, Ku will map to the character Ku, and Ra will map to the character Ra. So the the the, the same goes for uh, words like Sayonara or Kodichiwa, right? Of course, you can try this out here, uh, at home. I won't be demoing Japanese as well over here. So how different are Abugitas? So I was talking about diacritics. 
Diacritics are something, uh, I think even some European alphabets use, like I think Portuguese does use uh, diacritics uh, on top of letters. But these are a uh, little bit more advanced in terms of uh, they accurately represent uh, the vowels which add to the consonant that they use. So, sorry? It's French which uses diacritics. Uh, French, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think there are a few, few more. Uh, few like more like yeah, yeah. But uh, English very rarely use like one or two words I know which have diacritics put in there. Cool, so so this is how Abu Gidas are and and this will also if you remember this in your mind this will help you write uh, your uh, code. So I'll be introducing uh, a tool called IBUS. IBUS is the tool to write uh, in your local list. Uh, there's an addition to IBUS called M17N. M17 and uh, adds support for index index scripts like Devanagari, Kannada, Tamil, Gujarati, whatever. So uh, I use Arch, so if you're using Arch, you should use Pacman and install that or app install for Ubuntu. Uh, there's, there's a, there are a few more setup steps, again, I won't be going through those uh, in today's live demo, but uh, there are a few more steps to set up. Um, you can, I, I usually recommend uh, the Arch Wiki, which is a really good read uh, if you're stuck and you have to troubleshoot anything. Not because I'm Arch user, but it's really well written. Uh, once you install, this is how your uh, settings would look. Uh, these are the languages that are installed. Uh, English is the US keyboard that I have. But in addition to that, there is, uh, uh, you see there's HI, which is stands for Hindi, of course, MR for Marathi or whatever. And the I trans stands for transliteration. So transliteration is the easiest way, according to me, to type. You can experiment around, but what I, what I mentioned today would be transliteration. There's phonetic. There's something called Bolnagri. There's uh, something called inscript. Yeah, there are many ways that you can type. Cool. So that's it for the talk. Uh, let's go and jump into live demo. Unfortunately, the screen key is working under this monitor. You can't see what key, key strokes I'm typing, but I'll just say them out loud as, as in how I type them. Yeah, so let's first start with typing in Hindi. Uh, so I'll just type, uh, what is your name? So, Tumara Nam I will switch the keyboard <coughs> to this is also, this is Tamil, this is Marathi, this is Marathi. So I'll switch to the half the game over there. So is this visible? Should I increase the phone? Is this fine? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So as I type T, the half uh, the comes, and I want to make it two, right? And I want you folks to help because I'm not an expert in Hindi, so like. If I'm not using the wrong two and all the theory that you can be. Tum ha U M H A A will add the extra diacritic. Ra. Right? R 
A and A. So, okay. So when I type R, the half R comes, I type A, the R is complete and again A, it adds away. So it becomes Imara. I'll just it's it's as simple as this. So it's, 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 it's as good as I'm typing in normal, uh, 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 like like you type in English, I'm typing just like that and it appears in the, in the correct way. <coughs> and if you make a mistake, if you make a mistake, you can just uh, go back. So let's say, uh, instead of hey, I type hey, so you can just go back, you can wipe it out and... you Some protocol on the spellings? Yeah, so it's, it's a key combination, right? So, uh, like, if I write H A, it will become Ha. H. So, so first I write H becomes Ha, and I add a A, it completes the Ha. Then I add another A, it makes it Ha. Right. So, so basically, it's the same consonant and vowel type, the, the thing that I talked, right? Hi so, is H A I. Yeah. So H A I makes it Ha. So uh, H uh, is the consonant and then you just add a set of vowels to it. So H and A I I am adding the vowels and it's making it. So so this is the advantage of uh, the transliteration that I was talking about. So and if you type one just one full stop you get the English full stop you type it again it becomes the Hindi full stop as simple as that. Uh, so I can just uh, you can just type as fast like it depends on your practice. I'm I don't have that much of practice but I can just say um, yeah. So, yeah. And maybe this is a question, so maybe put a question mark. Or whatever, right? Let's try in Kokani. So, again, I want you folks to help out if I use the wrong uh, letters. So, uh, I'll type Tuja now, Kide. So, T U. And in Kobe, you put a dot on this. So, again, now. Dot is M. Dot is M. Yeah, it's a capital M. Yeah. So, normal. So, so you saw me making mistake, right? So, I was typing the small m. Small m gives more. The capital M gives the dot on top. Now, P, A. It completes. And so, K. Boils down to your practice, your typing speed will be fast. So again, it maps to the actual QWERTY keyboard, and it, it uh, so you don't need to buy a new keyboard or anything, or you don't need to learn the 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 the, the Unicode uh, numbers and all. So yeah. So uh, yeah, we did Hindi, we did Kokni. Uh, we'll do a bit of Tamil, and I don't know, maybe it helps. Uh, so I'll, I'll again, I don't know Tamil at all, the alphabet. Yeah, I mean, I, as many number of people can help me, uh, can help me. So again, uh, it's called uh, Unkar, Peya, and right? Yeah. That's correct. So I will switch my language to Tamil. So PA stands for Tamil. And I will type U. This is the U letter. Unkar. So it's something like this. Uh, it's with, with, with the dot, right? Yeah, exactly. The thoughts. So that's something like this is correct. Yeah. And then curve. Is this the right curve? No, this, this is the right curve. And row. Yeah. This row. No. With the dot. With the dot. Okay. This row. Yeah. And then sorry. P. This is P. Yeah. Here. Sorry. Without space. This is here, yeah. and this is here. Uh, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and 
then again, this is correct, right? Yeah. So this is like, uh, uh, what is your name? Okay, now I just wanted to be inclusive and include a South Indian language, so I'm doing that. And I'll write, uh, again, I'm, I'm referring here, but I might be wrong here, so I'm just taking help of it. I'm real time. So, um, N, so N is like uh, my, right? So, this is correct, uh, right? This is smaller one. Sorry, this is smaller. Smaller. Uh, sorry. Yeah. This one, right? Yes. No? No, sorry. This, no, this, this, no? Yes. And then again, the same as top, so let's see if I can type it on. Pay, no. Pay, no. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I just showed Tamil because it should not be just Devanagari, and uh, this should be possible in uh, any uh, Indian languages that uh, we use. Um, I just try one, one more in uh, Sanskrit as well, just for the for the heck of it. I've got a couple of minutes. Oh, how much time do I have left? Two minutes. Two minutes? Oh, time's up. Okay, fine. Then I'll then I, I, I just not put it. Cool. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that uh, you can. There's a lot to explore the way you type, like uh, religious letters, like how to type a religious letter, like O and things like that. Right. Cool. Uh, so that's how uh, Ibus looks. Uh, if you if you want any help setting it up on your laptop, you can approach me later uh, with Alina's laptop, and I'll help you set it up. Um. Yeah, uh, one of the things it's missing is the potential autocomplete support. Like when you type on your phone, what's the next letter that you are going to type? Uh, should uh, it, it, it appears there and you can just type it up. Yeah. So uh, just a like, point there, Kirit. Yeah. There's a project called Varnam project. Varnam, okay. Yeah, which kind of adds this support. So this support. Interested. Does it add it to iOS or? Yes. Okay, cool. That will be good. Does it add to all languages or is it? Uh, is it it's it mainly for Indian languages. All Indian languages. Not all Indian languages. They are in pieces. Okay, it is Malayalam and Tamil. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, no, no, no. This is just I'm saying that this is the potential support that. No, there are non-for solutions like. Yeah, this is basically the Google keyboard. It's it's non-for. It's pure proprietary thing that. And non-for has a lot of. Yeah, yeah, non-for. They have a lot of data to work with, right? Especially companies like Google. So yeah, they do. Yeah, uh, the other thing you might have seen is my presentation. I have made it in ImpressJS, which is uh, a tool for making presentations. Can you give us a fancy edition stuff? Yeah. Uh, how do you handle uh, word and word or official? Uh, uh, the, the joint consonants. Like, so, law is not. Law is, so that's why, so Kubernetes support is not there, but Marathi has the law, so I use Marathi keyboard for that. So I'll, I'll just show you, I'll just type command for you since you asked.
Shanti and things like that. So you can like type some for that, like, like, yeah. So yeah, that's that. Uh, Impress is also an open source tool to make slides, place them in 3D, and uh, yeah, uh, like I use that for this particular uh, slide show. Yes. In, in LibreOffice, yeah. So, so it, it runs as a daemon in the background, and um, uh, it, it doesn't matter what program you use, right? It it, it just here you can see it's curve. It's it, it, there's an iOS panel, so it doesn't matter what program you use. I can just use LibreOffice instead of my text editor here. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I guess then we are done. Now we have G. Karunagar, who is a project coordinator for IND Linux project. He helped to push fast localization for Indian languages with goal of localized Linux desktop. He has 20 plus years of experience in globalization domain. He works with Aware India as international internationalization architect. So good afternoon everyone. So while I am setting this up, so the previous talk was very good and it actually covered some of the things that I would have talked about. I have less stuff to talk about. So the key aspect here is so whatever IBUS etc. These tools are all like already present in the OS. So whenever you are installing Linux, everything is already there installed. So we just not, uh, you're not aware how to use it. So that's one of the problem that there's a lack of awareness as to how to use it. Similarly, even on the phones also, all the language support is already there. Even the keyboard support, there is a basic keyboard support that is there. But if you want some additional thing like that, for example, in Android, there is an index keyboard you can use that in Android. It supports all the Indian languages, and it provides all those features of a predictive text, etc. And as I said, uh, the awareness bit. So that's where some very like sort of contributors you can actually work on that, where you create the documentation or you write guides on how to use it. So if you are using a particular object, so you can just write a simple guide how to set this up or how to do certain tasks. And this also helps in uh, promoting FOSS. So there was this talk about uh, uh, using it with FOSS for NGOs, etc. So apart from whatever you are providing them or are having them use it, they are also kind of not aware of how certain software needs to be used because there is a lack of enough guidelines or documentation to do it. Okay, I have a stuck mouse.
Okay, let's uh, leave it. So to begin with, uh, I just wanted to share. So Fred has already told some bit of the story. So I wanted to continue that and uh, tell the Indic story. So how we brought this about Indian languages onto FOSS and the Linux desktop, etc. So in the very beginning, around 1996, that was when the PC Quest came out with the Linux CD, and then. We had a lot of folks would like now try out Linux without actually having to wait to download because that was still those days was still the dial-up days and you need to download uh, Linux to use it. And as more people started using Linux, these Linux India user groups and the Linux user groups, they started to form. And slowly we had more and more user groups and then events started slowly one by one specifically uh, linux focused events so there was this bang linux which was organized in bangalore and which later progressed into fos.in in future and around that time in 99 in linux project started so and then so on it evolved to ultimately what took for the fuel gate i love that so the beginning of the in Linux project, the basic goal was that uh, Linux desktop, it supported in English and many other languages, but there was no Indian language support. So the idea was that whatever you could do in Indian languages on the in, uh, English, in English, on the Linux desktop, you should have the same support for Indian languages. Basically using in any application, you should be able to type in your language, you should have the other facilities that are there, for example, like a spell checker or a dictionary, etc. So it was started by Prakash Advani and Venkatesh Sriharan in 1999. It started as a waiting list, and there were a lot of discussions, etc. And around for one year, it kept continuing what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and so on. And finally, it was realized like a list will not do. We need somebody to kind of sit and work on this. So that's when freeOS.com, which was being run by Prakash, he incubated, and uh, they got me into this project. So I was also just out of college, and then I had no clue, and uh, I only after a year I realized that I had bit into something which I, more than I could chew. So it was still list only, but uh, I had spent some time figuring out what needs to be done and kind of what are the different aspects that we need to get the language support properly. And then finally, to around 2000, when we started having some bits falling into place, one of which was Unicode support. Up till 1999-2000, Linux also did not have proper Unicode support. The only application which had a full Unicode support was, it was an application called UDIT which worked on all platforms for Windows, Linux, and Mac. And it's provided Unicode editing with different fonts. So where the guy was that he did a great effort and for a long time that was kind of the lifeline for people who wanted to use Unicode. So we got the basic bits, etc., and then we started uh, working on that. And towards the end of 2001, that's when we had our first meeting where we, a lot of the interested folks who were started working in this domain had met uh, at an event that is the Linux Bangalore. And then in 2002, we had uh, the Indic computing meet. So a lot of other technology people, people from HP, Microsoft, IBM, and so on, and a lot of other free software guys, everybody got together in September 2002, and we did a two day, full, two full days, brainstorming on Indic computing. What needs to be done, how needs to be done, what are kind of resources that we need, and so on, who can provide us the support, etc. And then slowly, once we got at that, and then we decided what needs to be done. So there were multiple events and workshops that were done. And also, while in, in Linux primarily, I was looking into Hindi language support, we also had a project start for other languages, like SMC was the Sapantra Malayana Computing, or Malayalam. Ankur was 
was for Bangla, Utkarsh was for Gujarati, and there was a Utkal for Korea, and Pun Linux for Punjabi, and so on. Each language kind of had its own group. It was not that everybody was working in isolation, they were connected, and we actually did an event where we brought everyone together to discuss and progress on the same. So here it's on just photos. So this is the CD that brought the change. I still have a copy preserved it. And this is the first meetup when we had in Linux Bank in 2001. And you can see a young friend <laughs> with a bag. Still And this is the Indian computing workshop that happened in Bangalore. So a lot of the folks uh, came from across India and we met very strong for two days and discussed, of course, you must be recognizing some cases. There is the Venki who is standing there. And there's the extreme right is Sunil Abraham who has also been part of the FOSS community for a long while. And the extreme left is Ravikant from Delhi is also active boss for Hindi. And in between Vijay Pratap is and so on. Uh, that person bending over is Ashish Kotamkar. And this was the first materialization of the event. So what we did was to have the Indic font workshop. We had a few people from Nepal and Bangladesh also coming in. So the focus of this event was that uh, that time we did not have Indian language fonts also ready. So we gathered all the knowledge as to how a font is to be designed, what are the skill sets needed to do the font, how to make a Unicode font. And around that time, this uh, technology called OpenType also came in, where the font uh, earlier you had to make for every shape, you need to make an independent clip, what is called a clip for the shape. Using OpenType, you could put some logic where, based on whatever characters you have typed in, the logic would do the implementation of selecting the glyphs from the font file and displaying it. So there are some other background programs which run like, at that time, point of time, it was called Pango, which did it for GNOME. And uh, font, for, uh, font Force, which was a tool to use to create fonts. So this group created, worked on creating a lot of fonts which became as free and open source fonts because up to that time we did not have proper free and open source fonts. And once we had the Hindi fonts running, we could now start doing some translation work. So a group got together to do translate GNOME into Hindi. So we started work, we, again two, three days people sat together and what all starting with some basic applications, we did the translations. And this was the result of that early version of the desktop. This was, I think, some GNOME 2.0 conversion. And around that time, keyboard was a rudimentary keyboard, which is basically what is the Linux system used what is called X Windows. And there was only one way to do keyboard input, which was quite a tedious to do that time. So we defined all the key maps required for Indian languages. IBUS, etc. came far much later on. And in 2004, again, we got everybody who is working in the language field. We got all of them together in Mumbai. And uh, again, brainstormed how we have reached, what all we have developed, uh, what further needs to be done, etc. So all the languages were represented, and they further took them Work, pro work progressed and they started also releasing their own work in the different languages. This was one of the discussion session going on. If you might see, there might be quite a lot of faces here. Maybe you might later on, if you look back, you will see those people have like gone ahead. They some have even found their own companies and successfully running companies, so on. And this was in the same 2004 in Linux Bangalore. We had like now something to show. We could put a Linux distro and we could configure it for Indian language. And we could show multiple languages. 
So we set up a stall. So Linux Bangalore gave us a prominent space in the expo. And we, we just set up a few PCs and then showed what all work was done. So this guy in the middle who is wearing the specs, you know, I forgot to tell him. He is a Tamilian. He came for the GNOME Hindi translation workshop. So initially we got a, a bit skeptical, but then his Hindi turned out to be quite good. So he made a lot of contribution in that early, early GNOME Hindi translation. Ananda Shankar, something. I need to go back to my emails to search. And of course, these two guys, black t shirts, those are the Gnome founders. Nat Friedman and Miguel Nikaza. And of course, as the Linux event started, uh, this became a custom to just sign on the poster. So I have a couple of posters there. Almost all the attendees of those events signed them up. And following up again on in 2005, we again went. So it must be becoming boring now. You keep meeting every time. But it was good, like, what the basic idea here was to like, get everybody who is working together once in a year to one place and then discuss, brainstorm, and then again diverse, and then do their things, and then again collect whatever has been done. And this was another Hindi translation workshop where we got some Hindi students to do some of the activities. This happened in Sarai in Delhi. The Sarai has been one organization also which hosted a lot of Indic events. Then further on, there were other meetings, of course, as you can see, more meetings. So every year, we constantly met in different events and then brainstormed. The work kept progressing further. I think around 2007, we were in a situation like almost all languages were supported on the Linux desktop. Uh, Probably Group GNOME and KDE, etc., they had the full support. And also, the inputs also kind of improved. The M79 that was talked about, that was the time when we wrote those M79 tables, which were used in another tool called Skim. There was a smart, uh, some common input method, but that was. Uh, Later on, IBUS came, which has an improvement over it. And the same, whatever the keyboard, etc., they got mapped to IBUS. So there were further, in meanwhile, also Firefox events started happening up where they started doing a lot of localization work. And Wikipedia was also getting active and they were organizing. And then there was Fuel project was initiated. Fuel was around the we were doing localization, but there was a lack of standardization in terminology. So again, uh, one guy, Rajesh Ranjan, he brainstormed this, and then he found that this frequently used entries in localization. And he organized, uh, painstakingly organized a lot of meetings to get the Hindi terminology, Marathi, under different languages. Again, a lot of meetings, doing uh, brainstorming on the words, and then standardizing on the terminology. And so all the different events at different periods. So after 2016, the people were quite active. Uh, but then from then, 17 onwards, the community was started dispersing. One prominent reason was a lot of the people who were working on it, they were all uh, Red Hat employees. So because they were hired by Red Hat to do translations. So there was some decision to do away with the translation team. So they all moved on in their career. And I was also, I was already, since 2007, I was not full time. I was only full time until 2007. And uh, other localization activity was happening, a lot of other post software, those were happening, LibreOffice uh, was happening, it was being done by CDAC. Similarly, Firefox, localization, Drupal, etc. Everybody was now having their own. If there was a host community, there was a part of it which was also looking into the localization of that. So overall, at that time, it felt like, OK, we have done enough. We can sit back, let others take it forward. The only active community which kind of remained continuously active, active was the Malayalam community. 
But then still, uh, there are a lot of unfinished things uh, which are there and which need some activity, which needs effort for volunteers. So one part is spell checkers. So even though you can type, but uh, type in LibreOffice, but you cannot. The spell check is very rudimentary. We did provide some spell checking support, but it is still very kind of basic kind that needs to be extended. And not much investment has gone in there also. Similarly, dictionaries or a lot of other software like OCR, TTS is all already there, but it needs to be tested and validated of that, OK, it works properly, and this is how we need to use it. And one idea which uh, was kind of abandoned halfway was the Indic computing handbook. So people got to write, started writing this handbook where it would document everything related to Indic, what needs to be done, or what is Unicode, what are the key maps, how to design a font, and all that. So that's one thing which we meant to do. And now it's also reviving and continuing the post localization work. So since uh, 17, the post localization and different uh, all the projects that has also kind of stagnated. So if there are folks who are interested to continue, revive it, so that's one area. And as I said, doing the documentation or even like just, you may not need to write the documentation, but even if you can just search around the net, see what all information is already available, if you can just collate that in one place, even that is also kind of sufficient to kind of create the awareness as to how Indian language need to be used. And what is already available, how to use it, so on. So that's it from my side. So any questions if anyone has? And thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. So from a desktop perspective, when you have a desktop, it supports Indian languages, you can use Indian languages. But let's say if you're going to LibreOffice, you're typing a document, you're writing a book, the spell checking support is not good enough. That's one area. And the other areas, if somebody wants to do text-to-speech, etc. Even though the stuff is there, it's not kind of validated to say that, okay, this works fine and this is the, what you should use and so on. So if you're developing some systems around this which require Indian language support, so there are certain problems. So one of it is actually still driven by the lack of awareness or how to use it. And the second thing is like the validation as to how correctly does it work. So all this needs some activity. So that's where we want to kind of, again, revive the activity, activities. So if folks are interested, we want to revive the groups and see what can be done and how it needs to be done. So OCR is language dependent. OCR. Yes, OCR is language dependent. So OCR, there have been OCR works, but again, as I said, there isn't be much variation. Somebody saying, look, okay, it's this, use X, Y, Z stuff. And so it becomes like, for example, you are an organization. So it's like an NGO, you want to add all those forms, fill them. Now you want to scan them. So is there a proper tool? There may be tools, but you need to figure out how to use it. There's no ready-made uh, guide which says that, okay, do this, 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 and this is how it will work for you, or use X, Y, Z library and it will work the best for you. So that needs to be done. So that's where we want some uh, activities. And again, people working for testing it out in different languages and then just coding it and saying, okay, this is what works and this is what doesn't work or it needs an improvement and so on. Okay, so that's it for my yeah. Yeah, so one key thing is like that movement, it was primarily centered around we want a Indian desktop, Indian desktop Linux. So much of the activities of all, they were centered around that. That we somewhat achieved. The actual localized desktop, whether that had any use or not, 
that was a different question because even though we have translated a lot of the desktops, but how many people actually use them, that's something which was not assessed. And then one other aspect is that 2010 onwards, the, and there was this paradigm shift in the way people use computing. So it was no longer the PC. It was the phone which became the dominant thing. And that's one space where we did not look into that point of time. Of course, we just looked at the terminology, keyboard support, etc. That is something that was looked at and there are apps. People have worked on that. But there are other bits also. So, for example, if there are a lot of apps, as I said, uh, if, if, if phone is the primary thing, then let's say if you are an organization or an NGO, you want to do certain things. What are the stuff that you need? What are the Indian language requirements that you have? There may be already stuff, so for like, example, take a spell checker or a dictionary. Or if you want a spell checker for the phone, somebody may already have written it somewhere. But we don't know about it. Maybe it's not prominent. We need to kind of search, somebody needs to test it and then write a, just a blog or maybe just a note saying that, okay, this is what we have tried out and this app works best for so and so language. So it's just a bit of documenting it, collecting and documenting. So there's quite a bit of activity like that, which can be do, done by students just to start with. And of course, the other key aspect has been that uh, GitHub etc. came around after 2010, and that's when we saw this massive explosion in open source and people getting involved in open source. Up till that time, point of time, you had these big projects which people would try to get into by filing bug reports or doing this or doing documentation, doing translation, but it was always kind of a bit of a pain to get in and be counted as a open source person. But now it's like very democratic and anybody, you have an idea, you have the, the design, you do the code, so you develop it. A few more people find it useful. And on GitHub you are appearing and to improving it further and it evolves into a different community. So we could use that same model for, to develop the Indian languages also. So that's it. I just highlighted some points, so it could be like built around use cases. For example, there was FOSS for NGOs. So what are the requirements from their side? So if those are kind of sought out, then we can see, OK, what needs to be done there, and then design some activity or derive some activities which need some volunteer work, which need some development work, and so on. So some folks, we need to kind of get all those requirements gathering part, and then we find or we just put it out saying, okay, this, this needs to be done. Who wants to get around or doing it? Then somebody can put in other design aspects, how you need to code or how you need to do that. Then the actual coding part, some other kind can come into it.
Our next speaker is Mr. Arun. He is a software engineer at the Forest Sciences, working on building machine learning platforms for scientific applications. Before Deep Forest, he worked as a project assistant at Rice Lab, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, for a, about a year. Um, in to, uh, May 2021, he graduated with master's degree in data science from PhD College of Technology. He will be sharing his uh, wisdom on technical documentation in regional languages. Let's give him a round of applause. I hope I am audible at, until the end. So, so, when I started my software engineering career, I never read the technical documentation. How many of you read technical documentation here? And how many of you don't read? Why do you guys don't read technical documentation? Maybe someone? We can make something logical overwhelming yeah overwhelming one reason <coughs> yeah. for me there were two reasons one is that it had too many pages and second thing it was overwhelming the language was hard for me to comprehend so for about three to four years i was programming in python language and during this time i never read the technical documentation and one day my mentor suggested me go and read the technical and for the first time I read it, I found numerous built-in libraries and functions which could have made me a much better programmer. But despite this fact that technical documentation containing detailed information, many of us don't read it. One of the reasons could be language. In India, as Nanai said earlier, only 0.02 percentage, which is about Three or three and a half lakh of our population has English as the first language. The rest of us, we think in our native language and then we converse, read, use English and whatever, and we mix it with our own native language and blah blah blah. So, so whenever we read something, we translate it into our native language internally and then we consume the information. So, this part, you know, it consumes an additional mental bandwidth. And for me, this was one part why I did not read technical documentation. So, when we translate technical documentation to regional languages, I believe that more people can read, be able to understand them. There are three main reasons why we should translate into te technical documentation into regional languages. The first one, Indians can build much better software. When I was building back in the APIs, I came across the word asynchronous. And I did not understand what asynchronous meant for the first time I read it. And it took me a long time to understand what asynchronous means. And without knowing what asynchronous is, I can't build asynchronous APIs. And today someone mentioned imperative programming. Again, imperative does not give me an intuitive meaning on what imperative means. And this is for majority of the Indians. So add to it the other technical jargons like asymptotic notation, heuristic, coroutines, yield, and so on. Yeah. When you have so many words, and since we are not native English speakers, a majority of us, we don't gain a good understanding of what the software does or how we can use it. But that's not even English. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's out of the you can have it. Out of so uh, I believe that having technical documentation translated into regional languages can help us understand much better software and due to the better depth of understanding we get. The second reason for translating the technical documentation is for adding diversity. How many of you believe that? English knowledge is required to build software. Almost. We need to know English. Yeah. Yeah. And this was so true when I realized, like, my professor said to me college, in college, meaningful names are always meaningful. I did not understand its meaning then. But when I, 
But when I name the variables as a, b, and the functions as just foo or blah blah, and I try to read my code after two months, things went dead. I could, I did not name it a or b. I did not know what the, what meaningful name to give to it. And the largest category of people who don't know English are usually marginalized people. If we translate the technical documentation into regional languages, the marginalized people can also learn how to build good software with a good source of information. Usually blogs or blogs you can find it, but they don't have the depth. When the documentation gives the depth and when it also can help the marginalized people to land a career in software engineering using a good source of information. The third reason for the love of language. Language is a shared medium for communicating thoughts and ideas. And when the documentation is English or when we build software in English, we use English to communicate the shared ideas and thoughts. And when a when we stop communicating on our regional languages, it's a slow and painful death for the language. It's a very, very slow. By translating the documentation to regional language and communicating or sharing our ideas in our native languages, we could add a tiny, tiny amount of longevity to our language. So now, there are three main points on why we should translate diversity, First one is building better software in India. Second one, diversity. Third one, for the love of language. Moving on, how should we translate? Sometime back, like during last October or something, I attempted technical translation of a popular Python web framework called as Fast API. And the, I faced two challenges. One is that I was neither proficient in my native language nor in English. English. And second one, Typing in native language was too hard. Maybe I should have heard Tanai's talk before attempting it. But so I did a very old school type of approach. I went to a local library and then picked up a dictionary, mapped words like what AS increments went into Tamil and a lot of things. But again, don't try this approach. It's, it won't work. <laughs> what you can do is come to the rest people and have doc attacks. Have a Google sheet of technical, pick up a technical tool or something, framework or open source software which you use. Have a Google sheet or a shared document where you have the translations, like a small mapping of words from English to a regional language. That come to them for three or four hours, maybe every weekend, just some three or four people and translate it. I think that's the best way and the fastest way to do it. Otherwise, it will have a lot of it will require a lot of mental bandwidth to translate documentation. And another issue which will arise is whether to translate the word or transliterate the word. For some English words, you can find a good intuitive meaning in your native language. But for some words, you won't find a native meaning. In that case, what I would suggest is think from the point of freedom. If a transliterated version will be more intuitive to understand, use the transliterated version. Otherwise, go for the translated version. Lastly, there are a couple of projects which you can take on as people. There are a lot of projects. If you are interested, I would like to share some projects. One is Fastly API, which is a Python-based web framework. And these projects have active translations going on in the regional languages. Next is React, and then you have Git. I mean, many of you have seen the Pro Git book, and also the translation for this project is also going on. And for a lot of new projects, they have a translation page. So, uh, why I came to give this talk is like, a majority of Indians, we don't know much about English. Like, we know English, but at a manageable level. If we look at the Chinese or the Japanese, they have this documentation translated into their regional languages. And I believe that it is one of the reasons why they are built to, able to build much better software. For example, the Americans have GitHub, the Chinese have their own version of Git, but we don't have our own version of Git on some self-hosting platform. So this translating will not 
help us to make it, but it will help us a tiny, tiny amount for us to be better software engineers. So let's make India great in software. Back to you. Thank you, Arun. Uh, now we have a lightning talk on open source hardware, where to start, by Mr. Carmelite Andras. Kindly welcome him with a round of applause. about software, 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 so what I thought is I'll just shift gears and give you a, a brief introduction to what open source hardware is and what is out there that you can try, okay? I know Mr. Kamath spoke about something called the Raspberry Pi, then a few other mentions as well. Okay, so to get started off with, okay, this was a presentation that I prepared here, so I mean, it's all over the place, sorry about that. But, in terms of open source hardware, just like open source software, the whole point about open source software is you have access to the code, you can modify it, and then build your own product, right? And then uh, release it under the same license, or depending upon what licenses are, you could do stuff based on that. Similarly, in open source hardware, what you can do is, there is no software here. So at the end of the day, when you say hardware, it's a schematic file at the end. Okay, finally, what you get, as an output from, say, a software like iCAD or Eagle or what have you, is a Gerber file, okay, which you then send to a manufacturer, and that manufacturer finally manufactures a PCB to you. You can ask that same manufacturer to do your pick and place. What I mean by pick and place is place those ICs on the board and give it to you back. Okay, so if you are open open source hardware, what it means is you're open sourcing your Gerber file. Okay, where you open source your code, here it is like you open source your Gerber file and a detailed documentation of it. Okay, so in hardware we have a joke wherein it says that it's easier to create the board than to write documentation for it. Okay, so the biggest challenge is actually putting documentation for hardware together. And the more detailed you are, the more successful you'll be. Okay, the biggest example of which is the first board that you see in blue over there, that's Arduino. Everyone's heard about Arduino, Raspberry Pi? Yeah, most of you have. Raspberry Pi is designed on it's, it's not open source. That's why it doesn't show in this slide of mine. <laughs> okay, so I'm coming down to it. But I know everyone's heard of Raspberry Pi. So, so Arduino is one of the boards that is open source. Okay, another thing which is open source is BeagleBone. Anyone heard of BeagleBone? Okay, cool. So I don't have to go in much detail. So BeagleBone is an ARM Cortex-based uh, processor. Okay, when they initially started uh, with BeagleBone, Right? The advantage was, the big advantage with BeagleBone was it had PRUs on it. What that meant is you had analog sensing that could be done. Okay, so when you work with a Raspberry Pi, and I'm going to compare stuff with Raspberry Pi because everyone's used Raspberry Pi and have knowledge about it, right? And there's a lot of huge community. So what that means is, what do you mean by a PRU? It's like a unit wherein you can do actual analog sensing. What do you do in a Raspberry Pi? Suppose you had to connect one of these LDR sensors. Now, LDR sensor is the one that you see in all these lights. Okay, the lights automatically go off and come on in the day. Okay, so if you were to do a Raspberry Pi thing over there, you would have to attach a capacitor, see when the capacitor charges, discharges, and calculate that time, and that would be your equivalent analog. In here, since it has PRUs on it, which are kind of like microcontrollers, 
you don't have to do all that. It has an ABC reference on it. Means it has analog pins on it. Okay, so that is an advantage of digital phones. Unlike the Raspberry Pi community, again, digital phone was started by a guy called Jason Kidner, who was a Texas instrument guy. Okay, so that's how he finally got uh, convinced him to work on that project for a long time, and then finally he got the digital phone out. Uh, I was lucky enough that he sent me a couple of digital phones, so I was able to test out and see uh, how usable or not usable it was. It was barely usable when they first started, like any hardware. Okay. In addition to that, if you stick around, now the whole thing is about Python, right? A lot of folks are getting into Python, and from a hardware standpoint, there's something called a circuit Python, micro Python, and all this. So there's a company called Adafruit. Okay, their whole business is around open source hardware. Okay, what they do is whenever they build something, they always ensure that they have their schematics as well as the Gerber files available so that everyone can modify. Yeah, they pulled, uh, like Lady Ada who actually runs it, basically has built a whole company around that. Okay, So there you can see a bunch of, on the right, okay, which are kind of dark in color. The circular one, that's called the circuit Python. I mean, it's called, okay, the, what is it? Neo Pixel. No, no, it's, uh, it's Neo Pixel, but it, uh, I think it's called Circuit Playground. I think that's the name of the board. Okay, so. That one, I've used that one. So what you can do with that, you can obviously program in C, but you can also program in something called a circuit Python. Okay, so you can flash the circuit Python bootloader in it. And if you know of Python, so you can directly adapt to this. So mostly this is something like the kids normally at ages from say eight standard above can easily play around with this, if they know Python. A, 90, a slightly more involved board is the next one. I've mentioned that board because there's another famous I won't say it's a movement, but there was a whole community around these chips called ESP8266, these cheap Wi-Fi boards. Okay, and a bunch of these cheap Wi-Fi boards are now in most of your so-called smart bulbs or your smart sockets. So finally, behind the scenes, if you open one of them, you'll see one of these cheap ESP8266 Wi-Fi boards. Okay, so this is slightly more involved. Again, you program in C, and there is also Python uh, library around that. Okay, so Adafruit has built one of their boards, they call it the Feather board. I think it's Feather ESP 8266 or something like that. The board um, is Node MCU or Node Yeah, there's, a, it's called, there's another board by Node MCU as well. So yeah, that's the board, but that I'm not sure is open source hardware. It comes from China, so I mean, there's a thing to it, right? So I didn't put it up here on this slide. But I've used a bunch of Node MCU, yes, because, yes, they're cheap. Right? So, the next one is another Arduino board. Uh, Arduino, when they started, they didn't have any connectivity as such. Okay, slowly they started adding connectivity. And uh, to my to my luck or bad luck, I mean, I passed out engineering in 2005. Okay, so that was when actually Arduino started. So I missed that whole thing with respect to uh, using an Arduino during my engineering days. But then, as soon as I heard about this, I got into Arduino and. First, when they started, you had to put the Zigbee modules and stuff like that to connect between uh, two Arduinos, okay? But now, if you go today, they have a USB-C connector on it, okay? Which is nothing like it. And you have various kinds of protocols supported, from Bluetooth to PLE to Wi-Fi, okay? And then you have LoRa boards as well, okay? The next thing is, I've just put the ones down there. Those are another two. Beagle bones, there was one small project that they did where they came out with something called a pocket beagle. Okay, so this was to kind of uh, make the board small as possible with the same Sitara chip so that it could be embedded into various other devices. Okay, and I'll come to a slide which talks about where all it's being used. So here is an example where you can directly have your old games like anyone's, I know most of you all are young, but people remember playing uh, arcade games like Super Mario and uh, Contra and all those NES games, right? So you could basically put uh, all those NES games, uh, it's a gray area, legal or illegal, I mean, you can debate all that stuff. But yes, you could have that and then you could put it on there and you could play those games on the screen. Okay, so if you're kind of nostalgic like that, so I mean, you could obviously try to do something like that. Okay, these are just a few boards that I have used. Okay, there are a bunch of other boards. One thing to remember is uh, there are a lot of boards that come out from China and some other places, right? And they slap that here open source, famous here open source logo on it. 
but it's not potentially open source. Okay, so that's something to keep an eye out for. So when you're buying something, if you want to support a company that is really making open source hardware, look for that logo, but do your own research behind the scenes. Yeah. Okay, so all these boards now are further classified with the emerging technologies that are up for debate today as well as being actively used. Okay, so one of them is in the IoT world. Okay, so there's a bunch of folks. It has become so cheap that you don't need to be in a company to actually do something related to IoT. You can get one of these Arduino boards, or you could get one of those feather boards, and they've taken it to the next level where you don't need to learn to solder now. So one thing that used to keep a lot of people away from electronics was, <laughs> you'll have to start the soldering iron, you'll get burnt and this and that. So all that stuff is gone out of the window. There's something called a few companies like C Studio have come up with these <coughs> automatic attachable connectors. Okay, so you could directly attach all those sensors that you see down on the right, which is like a temperature sensor, a buzzer, a button, and also a screen, a small screen, connected directly to a board. So you don't need to even solder. Okay, and then you can write programs in Python or whatever programming language you like on that board. So one thing I forgot to mention is BeagleBone actually supports uh, Linux operating systems, right? So you can, like Raspberry Pi on the BeagleBone, you can have a Linux operating system. They, when they first come out, they come up with something called as Anstrom. Okay, but you can obviously flash any Debian-based operating system like Ubuntu or pure Debian and so on. Okay. So here are a few examples like various technologies. The first one is the ESP32, I think. So ESP 8066 is older brother, okay, uh, not in age but in terms of power, okay. So it's ESP 32. Then you have like another board that has cellular on it. Then the board just below that has Bluetooth LE, okay. So those are the various boards. Similarly, Arduino. Uh, when the bigger board again first came out, it didn't have Wi-Fi and all this capability as I was mentioning. But since it is open source hardware. Seed Studio actually beat them to the punch and added Wi-Fi and uh, uh, what do you call it, DHA and all these other protocols to it. Okay, so that is one thing. So this is an advantage of open source. So maybe your team is currently working on something else, but someone else is out there, they can directly build off it, right? That was the big advantage. And then they built their whole ecosystem around that. All the sensors. Next big topic spoken about is mostly robotics. Uh, so with respect to robotics, there's a bunch of open source uh, hardware boards. You have the BeagleBone Blue. Okay, so if anyone's into uh, rovers or anything, you could use something like the BeagleBone Blue. Again, it runs Debian, Ubuntu, and stuff like this. Unlike the Raspberry Pi, with BeagleBone, the biggest advantage is you get something called as the Cloud9 ID. So you don't need to connect a monitor and all that stuff to get started with programming and stuff like that. BeagleBone, you just connect your USB in. If your operating system detects a USB host, I think in Windows, I'm not sure, you may have to install a driver or have you have not tried. But in Linux and on a Mac, you directly connect in. Something called as Cloud9 ID pops in. You just enter a URL, okay? And on that Cloud9 ID, you can write programs both in Python, C, and I think so it also supports Node.js or not this thing. Okay. So that is one thing, BeagleBone Blue. What you see on the top right over here, that is another Adafruit product, which is basically giving you, uh, I think it's 16 channels. You can connect 16 servos or four steppers, as well as motors to it if you want to make a robotics project. Okay, similarly, uh, that was, uh, down there was my attempt at building a quad popter, which was, which took a lot of pain, because when the story is, around building this, I didn't know anything about aerodynamics. Okay, so what I thought is, I'll look at how a quadcopter looks, design 3D, design one of them, 3D print one of them and see if it flies. Okay, that's a very bad approach. Actually, as someone was speaking just earlier without reading the documentation, if you start programming all those problems that you run in, that is what I ran in over there. But, but it was a good learning experience as such. Okay. Still, would I say that I know some aerodynamics? I had to learn it because I teach a course at uh, the course at ITI Kapura called Drone Technician. So since I am teaching that course, I have to learn aerodynamics forcefully. Did I enjoy learning it? Obviously no. But yes, that is how 
that came about. I'll show you the video towards the end. We have time. Okay. So yeah, robotics. The board that you could use over there for big robotics projects is for even a quad copter. You could use the bigger bone blue. Okay, there are other boards like Pixhawk which run R2 pilot and stuff like that. So if you're an engineering project or computer science guys, they normally use those Pixhawk boards. That is not open source. Uh, but yes, you can use a bigger phone and do your end-to-end -end project using R2 pilot itself. That's the same software. Yeah. Next, AJI. This is something that I've been wanting to get in. Uh, I know there was a bunch of folks who spoke about uh, AI. Uh, so the whole idea here is, what I've tried is that I've tried that five batch that you see over there, as well as uh, the AGI, but what my limitation was, I didn't know how to train and do all that, basically no time to get to all that, but what I was able to do is run a few examples, that is run TensorFlow Lite on both these boards. Okay, so if you want to explore AI, especially AGI, then these are your boards to go for. And if you're a strong Linux user, then yes. I mean, there is something called as the Beagle Bone AI, which is the white board on the left there, which is worth a buy. I think it's about 6,000, but it runs Linux and you get a bunch of experiences with respect to AGI running there. If you want to screen, do some screen stuff, then yes, you can try the Pi Batch. Uh, there is also an Arduino based thing, which is bottom near the crease over there. Unfortunately, I was never able to try that board because that board is currently stuck at Bombay Customs. I'm not sure when they're going to send it. So that's where that is. Okay, so next, moving really quickly is prototyping, right? So when you sp speak about prototyping, first thing that comes to people's mind is yes, a 3D printer these days, right? So before this, so 3D printing, why was it not famous maybe when I was an engineer, right? Why was it not famous in 2005? It was not famous because it was stuck behind a patent, which was held by 3D systems. That patent kind of expired around, I would like to say I may have the years wrong over there, around 2013-14. Around that time, once that period expired, a bunch of companies started developing 3D printing. There was a RIPRAP project that started, very similar to how the GNU project started. Based on those fundamentals, they started this whole RIPRAP project. And they started building 3D printers which could self-replicate. So from one 3D printer, you can make another 3D printer by making parts for it. Okay, so that is what they kind of uh, did. There. Here was one uh, 3D printer that I was trying out. Uh, soon after two years that they, I mean 3D printing to start became an active thing somewhere around 2013-14 was that 3D printer down there. Okay, so what I was trying to do over there is using the Beagle board, I wanted to control the 3D printer. Okay, so there was this software that was at a very nascent stage called OctoPrint, which basically allows you to control 3D printers. Now the fancy 3D printers that come, you don't need to do all this. They all come with a fancy screen, so you type in buttons click and everything prints out. Okay, so much so that you can actually design and click a button on your screen now via Wi-Fi, it's transferred to your 3D printer, the printer will uh, print. But these were like self-assembled ones, okay, so that was a self-assembled one. So the idea there was you could monitor the 3D printer from somewhere else because it didn't have a screen. Otherwise, you have to have a laptop connected which is running that software. And the problem was if your laptop goes to sleep, your 3D printer also stops. Okay, so all those issues, kind of solved by the vegan bone and this another open source software which is called OctoPrint that was being developed. So that was an early view into that particular software. Okay, so the best part about 3D printing, right, and how, why is, why am I bringing 3D printing into this whole open source kind of thing? The best part is, there is a site called Thingiverse wherein you can post your models, okay, and based on your models, either Based on the license that you give the model, obviously when I publish stuff, I put it under Creative Commons 3.0. Okay, well, okay, so what happens there is you could basically either use someone else's model, right, and build on that, or you can have your own model that you publish and a bunch of folks to build on that. So this was one of the early models that I had done somewhere in 2014, where that was a smartwatch. Anyone heard of the Pebble smartwatch? The one with the e-ink display. Right, so what had happened was I had lost my charger for the Pebble smartphone. I could have gone to one of the big shows and bought a charger and waited for days. Or I could have 3D printed a charger off. So someone had already designed another charger for another smartwatch. 
Okay, so you, by looking at that concept, I said oh, I could also try something. And after six or about eight tries, I was able to create my own charger by 3D printing. And those two things that are going there, if you know the basic USB, H2 wires plus a TXRX, those were just the power connectors that I gave there at the back of the charger. So that is something that you can achieve with the 3D printing today. Something small breaks in the house, you can fix it directly instead of waiting for the part. But I'm guessing that's not a big problem with Amazon shipping it. Okay. So finally, I wanted to mention Raspberry Pi. Okay, having said that, Raspberry Pi is not open source hardware. Okay, it is runs a bunch of open source software. Right, so that's that's why I've added here. So Bodhi mentioned the big thing about Raspberry Pi is it's got a huge community around it. I know Mr. Kamath also referenced this quite a bit. So that is one of the big things running for it. Arduino and Raspberry Pi, since it has a huge community, so if you make a mistake, you can get help. Having said that, within Goa, an observation of mine has been, even at engineering colleges, we still use Raspberry Pi. Okay, which I won't say is a bad thing as such, but I think so we need to move on to something more equivalent in terms of a beagle phone or what have you, so that folks have an ability to modify the schematic finally and come out with something new. Right, so that should be something, but yes, from a lower grade standpoint, it's a great move that we are trying to go towards the Raspberry Pi and teach people the nuts within Goa. Right. So, so move here. Okay, why open, why open hardware? Just a few points. One thing, before when COVID hit, everyone wanted to make COVID face shields. Obviously, it would take and bend a wire and make a nice, uh, make a face shield. But using 3D printing, you could have made a much fancier one, which you could have actually worn and gone to office. Right? So a bunch of folks, actually, in COVID, the first thing that they thought of is making face sheets and those lovely mask kind of uh, protectors or what have you. Another big thing is the prosthetics companies, if you think that's a huge, a lot of people call it a money-making racket, but it's there. With respect, if you want something customized, it will cost you like a huge delta. But with 3D printing, you could actually uh, kind of reduce that. Another thing is, if you have heard about this Volkswagen emission gate, right? This was one thing that happened a few years ago wherein uh, the Volkswagen catalytic converters were not up to the mark, right? And that actually was behind the scenes. It was caught by a few Adafruit sensors and an open source hardware board. And that's how they were identified and caught at the end of the day. It was not that some European, big European agency went and caught them Specifically, it was just caught by a few hackers who published it, and then the European agencies, I think, took action against them. Okay, with respect to the Beagle Bowl, yes, it's where all this is, is since it's open hardware, and it's a well tested platform, right? So it's in a bunch of places. They're in satellite networks, into thermal laser cutters, and a bunch of other places. So if you want to kind of develop something new, you could obviously do it. Okay, just added that point. And that's the most meaningful part, I think. So when you go to buy something out in the market, right, you never see how many patents that thing has. So when you buy an Apple iPhone, you don't say, oh shit, this has 16 patents. This will be better than buying an Android phone that has just four patents. Right? What you as a user are looking for is what value that thing is bringing to you. Right? So the whole point about open source hardware is, yes, you can be a profitable business. And as someone said earlier, uh, it's free, but it's not free as in free beer. Right? So you can obviously charge it as a service over time. Again, like open source software, the biggest advantage in hardware is you get community feedback real fast. Okay, so iterating on something will be will be fast. Like you, it's not like your old fridge sitting in the side there. Okay, and no one's kind of changed it. Right? So it's okay, I know most of y'all over here are from the computer background. Okay, so y'all would ask me, hey man, I'm into software, why do I learn hardware? Right? So, the only reason you would learn hardware is to pick up a few skills, which could be handy for you, maybe at home, or maybe if someone asks you, right? Put on your resume or what have you. So, as I mentioned, soldering, we actually don't need soldering to get, get started with anything embedded anymore. Okay, but yeah, soldering is a skill that is worthwhile having, breadboarding, uh, basic coding, I'm guessing most of you already know this, C, Python. 
One important thing is, uh, I would suggest if you are planning to get into hardware, is learn some kind of assembly language. Okay. So the whole point being, even if you are learning C today or writing the C program, if you don't understand like how a subroutine works, how branch instruction works, how against a branch LX instruction works, which changes states and stuff like that, right? That would give you more insight to become a good programmer. So the whole idea is that is why you would want to learn a basic ARM kind of programming language. And you get simulators on the internet for free. So you could try a code and stuff like that. Another thing that's slightly more important is SkyCAD. SkyCAD is another software for PCB design. It is GPL licensed. Okay, so you're safe there. And it's well renowned in the market. So if you learn SkyCAD, don't worry about it being shut down or sunsetted or whatever. And finally, for 3D design, unfortunately, for major scale 3D design, there are not that many softwares that are kind of open source. There's a software called OpenSCAD, so which if you're good at math, at, which I am not at. So if you're good at math, then you could use OpenSCAD to actually develop a software writing code, which is close to maths. Okay? Because finally, anything in 3D is finally a polygon. right? So if you can build out of that, you could learn using OpenSCAD. That's why, unfortunately, my computer, though it runs Debian, I mean Ubuntu, I do have to have a Windows partition so that it could run Fusion 360 and a few other software just for creating Okay, finding help. This is your starting point. Okay, so if you want to get started with hardware, this is the slide. If you want to take a picture, this would be the best slide to take a picture of. Is you start off with a product which is well documented. We've heard many stories about documentation already. So a good place to start is adafruit.com. Okay, that has very good documentation. They have a nice learning guide, okay, end to end for each of their boards as well as a bunch of other boards like BeagleBone, Raspberry Pi, and stuff like that. Uh, there's an element 14 community site. Uh, again, I put that a second because I used to write for them quite a long time ago. Uh, the next one is hackster.io, Sparkfun is finally Instructables. Okay, so those are the sites you would kind of visit to kind of start with hard. Okay, so I've gone through most of the boards real quick. Now the big question in your mind must be, what do I buy? What is my budget? So if you're a student, what is your budget and what do you buy? So again, an answer to that is, it all depends on you, what you want to do. Okay, so currently I can probably say that I moved my mom to Linux. Okay, and people will say, why did you move your mom to Linux? See, just by that red color keyboard down there. Okay, so that is the Pi 400, which is running uh, Raspbian. Now they call it uh, Raspberry Pi OS. So this, you could basically, it has 4 GB RAM on it. You could actually use it as an end-to-end -end computer, and this is something that Mr. Kamath also pointed to, right? Is you don't need to go and buy this fancy laptop or what have you. Obviously, it won't be portable, because you have to lug around a monitor with you. But Yes, that is the keyboard. Only thing you need is one mouse and a monitor to connect. Okay, the whole hardware of it, the whole Raspberry Pi sits underneath that board. Okay, so this, if you have around 8,000 to 10,000 rupees, that's the board to go for. Plus, yeah, and it's a keyboard size. Right? And it has those GPIOs down there that you see. That means you could obviously try out all your circuitry, basically breadboarding and do all that kind of stuff. If you want to go lower than that, your budget is say 2000 to 3000, then try the Raspberry Pi 0W. Okay, there is a Wi Fi version, they have multiple versions 1.2, 1.1. 1 .1. Figure out which one is the latest one, and you can try that one. So that runs a full fledged OS, but it will be slow. But say if you're doing a Linux project or something with respect to AGI and all that, you could buy one of those, okay, for a cheaper list. Once you get bored of it, you basically don't throw it away. You could still use it at home. What you could install is something called as a pie hole, which will stop all these ridiculous ads that come to you on your web browser and stuff like that. Okay, so you could just have it running with your, uh, what do you call that, Wi-Fi router or whatever router you have at home. You could use one of those. Slightly more expensive option is, if you're doing something in C, then the top half of the slide is for you. Okay, C and then say, Circuit Python and stuff like that. If you want to do the OS stuff, it is the bottom half of the slide. Okay, so that's how I kind of get it. Uh, what I would recommend if you are at an engineering level or even doing something at Goa University, 
step up and try the legal bone. Okay. Pies, I mean, if you look at it, even I've looked at uh, syllabuses from outside the country, most of the engineering as well as after 12th standard, they always try and use the beagle bone. The syllabuses are created around the beagle bone. Okay, so another story is in, uh, I'm also doing a master's degree simultaneously, so we unfortunately are still using the pie. But again, having said that, we are trying to rally some of our faculty to change that to move it towards a beagle bone. Okay, but I think that's slow. It's going to take a few years. Yeah, I think that's all I had. Any questions? I'm hoping that this was the main question I wanted to answer. I'm hoping this is kind of answered. What do you buy? Right? So yeah, in terms of the feather, feather would go for about 800 to 900 rupees. The beagle bone would be around the 8,000 mark. Okay. A good place to buy this stuff is not Amazon. Okay. Please don't buy hardware or electronic stuff like this stuff from Amazon. Okay. Because I think the return policy thing that creates a problem wherein the hardware gets damaged or what have you. Okay, but the best place I have found is places like Roku.in. If you've heard of Roku.in, then that's a good place to buy. I think they are based out of Kerala or Tamil Nadu, I could be wrong. MG Super Labs. MG Super Labs, yeah. And you can buy it from element14.in and stuff there, but they have a shipping component to it, so yeah, it works all that stuff. Sites which are which import on order. So if you order, then they import it and they which which are those websites? Digi key. Ah, Digi key. Okay. Yeah, I've heard of it. But then if you can get stuck in customs. Yeah. So that happened to my Arduino board. Actually, I was sent that Arduino board to road test. Okay. For some reason, they are saying that some protocols or something are not mentioned. Therefore, it's stuck in customs for almost a year and a half now. Okay. I lost hope. So. Okay. So I faced a similar issue. The website mentioned uh, that. Uh, they will not be paying customs, but it, it was mentioned in a way that there is no customs. Okay. So I ordered the stuff and then it ships through DHL. DHL has a policy in which DHL pays your customs okay. and then collects it from you during delivery. So this is DigiKey. Why DigiKey you did this? Uh, no, it was another website called UBuy. UBuy. Okay. I ordered on UBuy and then uh, they ship via DHL. DHL paid for a thousand rupee item that I ordered. DHL from their side paid for 500 customs without asking me. And then they try to collect it from the end user. So they pay customs and they clear customs in Bombay and they ship it to Goa, but then they do it without asking you. They pay it themselves and they try to collect it from the data. So another last thing is, most of you would have heard about the chip shortage wherein we are not getting raspberry pies and stuff like that. Yeah. A good alternative is your beagle bone. Okay, so if you start it there, you're not going to lose anything in terms of raspberry. Yeah, that's all I know. No more questions. Back to you. Thank you. 